Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, you have survived the first half of uh, Code for Lib on the first day. I have checked. There are no hurricane warnings, tornado warnings, or anything like that on the agenda. I cannot confirm whether or not Godzilla has been sighted in the Finger Lakes. I'm sorry, just don't have that information. So welcome. So just some announcements before we get started. By the way, I am Kate Dybel. I'm your afternoon moderator. Um, so first of all, the community support volunteers for the afternoon are Eric Fetplace and Chad Nelson until 3 p.m. They're in the back there, and then they will be replaced with uh, Bobby Fox and Andromeda Yelton from 3 to 5.15. They are located in the back of the room and are wearing the zebra stripe, you know, they're like referees and umpires, uh, uh, lanyards. The online community support volunteer is Jackie Gosselar, who will be uh, who will be on Slack from one until five fifteen p.m. Please remember the med students will be studying for board exams, one of the biggest exams of their lives. So consider your volume when you're outside during breaks and everything, and particularly when you're socializing. There's there are also anatomy students in the building. And yesterday it was tough to catch an elevator that wasn't full around 515. So if you need an elevator, you might uh, have to wait a bit. Uh, just a reminder, all Q&A for Zoom is going to be on Zach. So those are for Zoom talks. If there's time during in-person talks, which we have a few this afternoon, we will try to have that if we can, if there's time. This conference also, we need to recognize the people who made it possible. And particularly some of those grand champions are our local planning committee. So let's take a minute to thank the, these people for their effort. So let's wait, you know, applause now. And then hold your applause as I list out a bunch of these names. So from the University of Buffalo, Carlin Chase, who has been keeping a rather, she's, She's been holding it together this morning, which is awesome. She definitely deserves, uh, you know, a round of thanks and maybe a beer later. Uh, we also have from University of Buffalo, Sarah Cogley, Omar Brown, Carolyn Klotzbach Russell, Molly Maloney, Amanda McCormick, and Rose Orcutt from, crap, I have never learned how to pronounce it, uh, the racist, Lyrasis. Lyricist, okay, I have just learned that. Uh, Blake Carver, thank you. And from Princeton University Library, we have Fr Francis uh, Gahua. So I have to hit page down now. Just a reminder too, that if things are getting, you need a bit of a break, there is a quiet room available across the atrium in 2212 A and B. The, there's a large sign between the two doors, uh, the A and B doors to get there. So it's a place where you can relax, you know, just take a break, which you should do. Code for Lib can be very intense. Now, also, if you're looking to refill your water bottle, there are two refill stations uh, in the back of this room, one on the left and one to the right. I think that might've been your left and right. I failed left and right in kindergarten. Uh, also, just re rem a reminder about bathrooms. There is a, There are two single user bathrooms on this floor. One is 20, uh, sorry, 2110C, and the other one is 221A. Some lightning talk updates before we get going. There are still four lightning talks uh, slots available, so it's not too late. We generally encourage our newcomers to do lightning talks. We, we love to celebrate newcomer lightning talks. Uh, lightning talks will we'll still have slides, but, we'll, but we will not be doing presenter notes for them. It's going to be there's a lot of setup that we have to deal with that. So, and also lightning talks must be presented from the podium computer. You'll be using Zoom screen share. So unfortunately this is a PC. So if you're using a Linux or Apple or some other operating system uh, program, you're going to have to convert. So we're actually a little bit early. So we'll take a few minutes and unless we want to get going, but we do have group talk, two talks starting at uh, 1.30. So last uh, call for, you know, bathroom breaks and all those fun things. So, you know, 
get settled in. And by the way, in case you're a person who subsists on caffeinated uh, sodas like I do, uh, if you go that direction and you pretty much, I think, only have about 30 minutes for it, there's a little community shop uh, where you can uh, purchase Pepsi products. So hang in there a little bit and then we'll get going. It'd be great to have uh, the group two presenters maybe start coming down this way so you'll be ready to present. Just the one, two. Can everybody hear me? We're good. All right. Now, all right. Let's get it closer. How about now? Is that good? All right. <laughs> I know I had a hard time hearing everything in the last one too. Yeah, I was like this. <laughs> All right. On my collar. How about that? No? Yeah. Try it on this side too. All right. How about that? No? Better? All right, everybody hear me? I can project louder than this. So if I speak at like this volume, are we good? All right, cool. Thank you. Okay. Do we dare break uh, Code for Lib tradition and actually start early and maybe keep time? Carlin has uh, given us a thumbs up, so let's go ahead and begin. We are starting uh, the first set of afternoon talks with Alyssa Panetta talking about living the UX when a web developer develops a, uh, develops a di disability. That was a lot of Ds. <laughs> It's on purpose. <laughs> Hi, my name is Alyssa Panetta. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I'm very excited to be here today to share this presentation, Living the User Experience When a Web Developer Develops a Disability. I'm the web designer and front end developer for uh, the university libraries at the University at Albany here in New York State. Um, so today I wanna to share my experience with disability. And then um, as a web designer and developer who dis developed a disability later in life, and then I'll share some thoughts on how semantic HTML and modern CS, CSS can make the internet a better place to be for more users. So a bit about me. 
I started making websites in 1999. Uh, I was an internship in a math software company. It was my first year at undergrad studying math. Um, and I've been doing it ever since. And I started my current role at the university libraries about five years ago. Uh, in October of 2020, I acquired a cognitive, visual, and motor disabilities, thanks to my breakup with Tallulah, my brain tumor. <laughs> Uh, this was October of 2020 in the middle of the pandemic, and this is how I learned that she was there, and the doctors told me that she had been growing in my head for about 20 years, so as long as I had been making websites. So since then, I went through surgery, radiation, and chemo, and as of this past March, I'm extremely lucky to say that I'm okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I owe it all to my doctors. <laughs> uh, I'm here, they've got Tallulah preserved in a tumor bank in New York City. And we're gonna talk about how this tumor changed my perspective on accessibility and the way that we make websites today. So the first web pages before I got there back in 1991 uh, at the birth of the internet, they were supposed to be flexible and they're mostly text. They look like Word documents with links and the idea that every computer should be able to access and read them. Around 2000, when I started making websites, things had changed by then. After Flash came out in 1996 and became the cool thing to use, uh, websites started being built within the box of the Flash player, which was only about 800 by 600 pixels. And it was like a little TV screen inside the web page. If you weren't using Flash, and I wasn't, uh, you would even try to make sure that your HTML sites fit within that space too. Uh, and to do that, you'd have to count pixels and you'd have to keep your designs very rigid. And the best tool for that were HTML tables, which if you use those, you know, they're not great tools. <laughs> uh, so then CSS grew, and the first big change that I saw in how we make websites happened around 2007 when the first iPhone came out. So now we could go uh, view web pages on the go. We had a new screen size, a whole new orientation, and touch. So this was a whole new paradigm, and this is what we call the responsive era. And we used, handled them using new CSS media queries. And then there was the addition of Flexbox in CSS, which came in 2013. And this for me was another turning point in CSS for the progress we're making today. This is where modern CSS for me starts. Some people say it started more like grid, but I think this was the turning point. It's also sometimes called intrinsic design. Um, it's a world in which containers and content move, grow and flex in relation to each other. So since 2013, CSS has come a long way. And for the first time in 20 years, I can say it's an exciting time to be working with CSS and HTML. And I think that's especially true if you're working on, on accessibility. The pandemic had a huge effect on society and the internet, uh, of course, with the everything going online from school to work and medicine, uh, the emphasis to prioritize accessibility is greater than ever. One of my priorities as a web designer at the libraries has been accessibility. And that's by means of compliance with the web content accessibility guidelines. And compliance with with WCAG 2 is based on these four success criteria. Your site needs to be perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. So what does that really mean? How do we measure that? Basic measures of an accessible site are these. You need alt text on your images. You need color contrast for your text, video captions, and you need to support keyboard only operability. And there are automated tests we can run to measure our compliance. So my site's compliant, but none of these features really helped me uh, with my new cognitive disability. So I started wondering about WCAG 2's priorities. And as a math nerd, I started looking at stats uh, regarding digital accessibility. And I wanted to know more about the user population because now I was part of it. So I started with the CDC's website and their report from 2018 said that one in four Americans have some kind of disability. And from a chart called percentage of adults with functional disability types, I saw that 4.6 of American adults self-identified as being blind or having a serious difficulty seeing. Now let's look at the whole chart. So comparatively, vision disabilities are low. 
Now, not all of these categories are relevant to digital accessibility, like mobility, the biggest one, uh, they define that as walking or climbing stairs. So that doesn't really have much about uh, you know, digital accessibility. And then there's independent living and self-care, which also aren't relevant. So let's dim the lights on those. And we can see that cognition is the largest disability category for digital accessibility. It's 10.8%, which is a little higher than vision and hearing combined at 10.5. But this is not a user category I'd ever been designing for. They've never been on my radar. <laughs> and I've never seen them mentioned, but oh my goodness, this is me. I'm in this group. Uh, so after my brain surgery, I felt a lot less alone. Um, so WCAG 2 was first published in 2008. Since then, we've learned a lot about the diversity of disability, and the good news is that they're on it. Uh, WCAG 3 reflects the uh, diversity of disability by moving from the four success criteria and focusing on functional needs. It's four years away from being finalized, but we do have a draft and we can start using and learning from it now. So let's take a look. So these are the functional needs. Uh, there's about 13 of them on here. And um, you can see it really reflects that diversity. Um, and the functional needs describe a specific gap in one's ability or a specific mismatch between ability and the designed environment or context. It also acknowledges that functional needs can be situational or temporary, like somebody with a broken arm, long COVID, or a distracted parent. And the W3C has even organized a task force dedicated to cognitive accessibility. And they identified these new functional needs. And this is about half the list of the, the original ones that we just looked at. So you have attention, language and literacy, learning, memory, executive function, mental health, and cognitive and sensory intersections. They're publishing a great document called Making Content Usable for People with Cognitive and Learning Disabilities. It's a great resource and uh, you'll have the link and a lot of other links uh, if you download this presentation. I have a lot of links and I'm not gonna have time to get through nearly all of my slides. So <laughs> we're gonna have to jump those. And we saw that cognitive is the largest disability category. We know these numbers are only gonna grow as we age, right? Who here has issues with their memory? Yeah. I do, certainly now. Um, and have you ever seen that get better as you get older? No, it just goes down, right? Um, so not only are we going to get older, but you never know when you might have a brain tumor removed and you might need a little help. So my new challenges were across disability categories. I had uh, trouble with my vision. My, I was incredibly sensitive to light. I still am. If you see me outside, you'll see me with a baseball cap and big sunglasses on. Um, and uh, I have a seizure disorder, poor memory, got worse. Uh, all of these things, like they just got worse, you know? Um, I have a uh, right side, the tumor was on my left side. So it caused like weakness on my right side. So every now and then I have like a little spasm, um, but it's a lot of things, right? And how could you know what it was like for me to use the internet with this combination of issues? You just can't, right? You can't know what kind of assistive tech would help me. It's like life, unless it's yours, you can't really know. And even after I give you a little walkthrough today, you're still not gonna have you know, like the best sense of what it is to be me. But what can you do without having a brain tumor and brain surgery? How can you get an idea of what my user experience is like? So if you wanna know a user's experience, the best thing that you can do is to try it on. You can try on the technology someone might use. When my develop disability developed, I realized that this was something I had not ever done. I had only like listened to somebody use a screen reader in like a video, um, but I had never tried it myself. So let's do a show of hands. Has everyone tried a screen reader? Who has? Cool, that's good. How about your browser Zoom? Is browser Zoom a lot? Okay. Um, what about reader mode in your browser? All right, so we're going down in numbers for uh, anyone not being able to see here. Um, what about a voice assistant? Yeah. And do you ever use a browser plugin that like overrides CSS on the other people's pages? So you write your own? Yeah, a couple people do, cool. So you guys were ahead of me, awesome. <laughs> 
So uh, as soon as I got back to the computer, I had a really hard time. I'm used to working very fast on a computer, as I'm sure everybody here is, but I couldn't do it. I burned out within minutes and my eyes were really, really struggling. So there were two major things I had to do. One, I had to slow down, which was really hard and take a lot of breaks. And two, I needed larger text. I needed every bit of text on my screen to be like three times the size especially at first. So I went straight to my OS settings. I'm on a Mac. And this is where I was set before. If you can see all the way at the top, the uh, how small the text is, that's where I was comfortable before. But um, I had a lot of room for a lot of things on my, on my screen. This is where I'm at now. I'm all the way at the other end of the settings. I had to sacrifice all that screen real estate to get the text still not quite big enough for me. Like in the, uh, the system preferences up at the top, that's still not very comfortable. So I started going to my applications and this is where working on the internet was really helpful because mostly I need a browser and a text editor to do my work and they support Zoom. So the WCAG 2 standard says that a user should be able to Zoom up to 400%. But doing that in every browser had its own pain points. Uh, one, I was always confused with a mobile user because I was zoomed in by default. Two, infinite scroll uh, wore me out like nothing else because nobody ever gave me a chance to look at anything else. And three, I still have not found a combination of assistive technologies that play nice together for what I need. I still don't even really know what I need. Um, so let's take a look at some of those. So when you zoom in on a site, what it does is it reduces the width of the viewport. So that is how we trigger media queries for mobile a lot of times. So when I zoom from 120% to 170 on this email from my bank, the email switches to the mobile layout. Now this is not the worst thing, but being somewhere between mobile and desktop views can get really confusing. Let's look at uh, our library discovery layer, it's Primo. Say I wanna find articles on CSS. So this is at 100%, and this is a typical layout pattern for me. I'm comfortable with this. I have a top menu and search. My left sidebar has the filters. All the content I'm looking for is centered. Very familiar. My brain is happy, and it has no trouble drilling down to find just articles. But what happens when I zoom in? Well, here we are at 200%. We're not even close to 400, and I have no idea where the filters have gone. This is not familiar to me, and my brain is not happy about it. So I have to go looking for them. I start scanning in the upper left and it's not until I get to the bottom right that I find them. They're way down there where I'd least expect them, especially since I'm accustomed to finding other icons there, right? If you use Primo, you, you've got uh, the pin, you have all these other icons at the record level on the right. So, and you can see like, I mean, this is my own page and I have not fixed any of these things yet, but it's getting, it's gonna get lost when you scroll under the chat widget and uh, a lot of other things. So do you see how like, this is a small thing, but it took me ages to find that <laughs> compared to how I'm used to finding things online. So it's a big difference on my cognitive load. That's the point. The cognitive load is increased significantly by having to look, look for things. Because you want users to rely on the patterns that they already know. That's one of the ways that we design and make it easier for people. All right, moving on. Infinite scroll. I've always had problems with compulsions and snacking has always been my hardest. I have what I call an open container law. If I have a bag of Oreos and it's not open, it's fine. I can leave it there. I don't wanna eat any of them. But as soon as that bag is open, my compulsive brain wants nothing more than to empty it. So I have to eat everything in the bag. And this is worse for me in the digital realm. And I know that social media and shopping sites are designed to take advantage of this weakness, but I'm mad at them because this is exhausting to me, me, me in my eyes. The scroll gets disorienting after a while. And sometimes I even get a little motion sick. So overall, the feeling was just overwhelmed. That's where I was. I had too many choices, too many combinations, too many options to even think about. So it wasn't long before I just stopped trying. I kind of have my things where I set them now and I just, I just deal with it. And that's what happens when users can't use your site. Eventually they'll just stop trying. So as a user, I was overwhelmed, but as a designer, I'm now determined to practice better accessibility and share what I've learned on my journey and help make the internet a better place. All right, great, we're at five left. Um, so that's my experience. So now we're gonna go through quick 
about semantic HTML and modern CSS and how uh, these are going to be the keys to, uh, to, 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 to making sites that are, that are accessible to a lot of people. Uh, definitely download this for the links. I'm going to scroll past some real quick things. Um, first, let's think about our digital accessibility, more like uh, physical accessibility. So it's a real photo on my campus last week. Um, if you can't see it, there's a short set of stone stairs with a metal ramp that's laid across them leading to a grassy area. The ramp bottom doesn't quite meet the stone steps, so there's wood underneath in some places, which mostly looks rotted out now. So if you knew from the start that you were building a campus where users needed wheelchair access, is this the kind of ramp that you would build? No, of course not. Um, and if you use a wheelchair, when you get up to this ramp, do you really want to go down it? <laughs> And if you don't, is this something you even want to look at when you walk past it? I walked by it and I was like, this is a nice and pleasant environment. I don't want to walk by this. Um, so this is what happens when we treat accessibility as an afterthought or just so that we're in legal compliance. We make a mess and we ruin it for everybody. So ideally, you would want your ramp to be built out of stone too. So um, stone in this case is our semantic HTML. And uh, H semantic HTML versus just regular HTML is HTML that has meaning. So it's tags that have, have meaning. Um, so everything, every user agent that goes there, it starts with the HTML. So um, this is the most important thing you can do. It's your stone of your, of your website. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Uh, we have two versions of my site's footer on here. Just a quick show of hands. Who thinks that the one on the left that has all these divs and P's and spans is the semantic version? And, all right, you guys are smart. I love it. <laughs> so the one on the right is semantic, right? So we know that uh, divs and spans only have meaning for layout and you have to attach classes and IDs. But the classes and IDs, if you use a, uh, an ID of nav, it's meaningless to everything except your style sheet. So it's not the same. And semantic HTML has one other huge advantage as we move forward because the responsibility of accessibility is shifting from the designers. And even though we know we can do like 67% of accessibility, like uh, uh, bad things can be prevented uh, in the design phase, but the browsers are stepping up and they have, uh, they have a, a thing called Interop 2022. And it's a cross-browser initiative to find, address, and work towards fixing major interoperability issues. Mozilla had a statement about the project, and they said, the more semantic information the browser has, the better it can do at providing accessible versions of content. So even more reason, make it your number one priority, and uh, then work on your CSS. So this is the important thing about the CSS, you have to provide flexibility. So let's talk about what we can do to build flexible and resilient sites that increase our chances of uh, exponentially of supporting all kinds of users. This is also future-proofing when you do this because we don't know what's coming next, right? Who knows how the metaverse is gonna you know, deal with things. Um, so how do we do that? Well, CSS has a bunch of really new uh, features and um, these are the ones that I think are the most impactful for uh, adding flexibility to your site. So I don't have time to go into depth any of these, but I'll run you through some highlights and there's links to uh, experts. So um, one is relative units. If you're not using, uh, we're broken away from the pixel entirely. Um, so we have rem, m, percents, we have the ch character, we have units for the view height, view width, minimums and maximums. So use those, they're great. Um, these are some wonderful resources um, on how you can do those and uh, make your site awesome. Um, there's CSS math. And uh, my favorite, as a math nerd, <laughs> uh, my two favorite uh, uh, functions are calc and clamp. Those can make everything flexible. Um, calc lets you mix units. So if you do have a, if you do have a site that has pixels, if you have like an old bootstrap site and you need to calculate things between like your view width and minus certain amount of pixels, you can do that. Um, and then clamp is awesome because it lets you uh, establish a, a minimum. I'm sorry, I moved forward. A minimum, a maximum, and an ideal value. So yeah, all right. <laughs> 
Um, so there's calc, you have media queries for user preferences, grid is awesome. And you have container queries, which are the next game changer. They're so new, I don't know anything about them yet. But again, there are some, uh, some resources here. Um, so yeah, you can't know it, but you can try it on. So try it on. Make sure you start with semantic HTML and go for flexibility with modern CSS. Again, uh, download the presentation. You'll have all these links and I have them up on a GitHub page too. So thank you so much. Uh, my name is Alyssa and thank you. <laughs> That's all. Thank you very much, Alyssa. Great talk. We're switching to a Zoom talk right now, which will be with Thomas Dotson talking about eBooks and accessibility. I'm wondering if there's a theme to this session. I'll just right, well, if we're ready, I'll, I can just bring up my presentation. All right, and I'm starting a timer for 15 minutes, so I'll go over. Um, so uh, I'm talking today about um, specifically EPUB 3.0 and accessibility. Um, uh, usually when I give this kind of a talk, I, I have a number of different tools for viewing, previewing, and editing uh, EPUBs, and we look at all of them, but don't really have time for that. So uh, the best way to get access to that is, uh, uh, as with Alyssa's talk, to, to download the slides, which can take your, there are, a lot, there are many more slides in that version than in the version I'm presenting today. And then also this bit.ly link uh, takes you to um, a set of resources that, that cover this topic in more depth. So um, just to kind of be on the same page, uh, the vast majority of ebooks, things that people we refer to as ebooks, are, actu are actually read on digital devices in only a handful of formats. Um, that includes EPUB, which many libraries still have EPUB 2.0s in their collections, um, and uh, the newer standard EPUB 3.0. Mobi, uh, well, so EPUB is the sort of generic vanilla uh, format for ebooks adopted by Apple, Sony, and others. Um, and, uh, it, and again, the format held, uh, held by most libraries. So uh, there's this other format, which uh, uh, because of its open source past still gets referred to uh, by ebook developers as Mobi, but is now a proprietary Amazon format. We won't be talking about that, um, except to say that most people make EPUBs and then run it through a conversion so that Amazon uh, can, read it, can read it in their proprietary formats and on, on Kindles and things like that. I often offer the analogy of like, it's like Internet Explorer in the old days. They have such a huge part of the market share that they just sort of make their own rules and we have to, we have to make for them too. Um, and finally, iBook, which I also won't be talking about, which is a format uh, that, that's uh, specific to Apple devices um, and has a lot of really great stuff for uh, like textbooks, like um, online quizzes and a lot of uh, embedded media and diagrams and things like that. So really great, but um, uh, limited to uh, Mac, uh, Mac, Apple devices. So I'm not going to get into that. So the best way that I have to describe what it, uh, why e why it matters to ha have an EPUB, uh, and even though some uh, folks may refer to any like scan uh, monograph or whatever as a PDF, like a PDF, as uh, an ebook, uh, really what we're talking about is EPUBs. Um, so uh, we, uh, Alyssa talked a little bit about the need for uh, being able to adjust the size and, and flow of text. Um, and that's one of the things that makes uh, EPUBs sort of intrinsically more accessible than um, either uh, PDFs or actual uh, print objects. So um, reflowable text is the biggest part. Um, uh, I'm sure you're probably all familiar with this. Um, in one of, the, one of the worst experiences you can have reading a, a PDF is needing to have the text lar larger, zooming in, and then you get this horizontal bar where you have to like read as far as you can until it hits the width of the display. And then you have to scroll to the right to get to the end of the line. And then you have to go down and then scroll to the left to get to the beginning of the next line. Not very easy to read. Um, so if you need the text larger, um, that PDF's not a great way to go. Um, usually the font style and size are fixed. Um, uh, and I would say like PDF is a kind of a more designer centric format uh, as, a, as a, someone who has done some print design and stuff. Um, you know, I love it because for its fidelity to like what it's gonna look uh, to the original. Um, you're turning a page using vertical scrolling, which again, Alyssa mentioned a little bit about how that can be um, annoying. 
Um, it does provide you with the ability to have exact image positioning. The relationship between image and text can be, can be fixed. Um, and again, if you're a designer, that sounds great. But um, I would describe EPUBs as uh, their, their main thing is being more accessible and more reader or user centric, right? So the reader controls the font uh, size and in some cases the font style um, the, or the, 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 the typeface. Um, you can swipe for page turn, um, which uh, with having some kinds of uh, uh, print disabilities, which I'll mention, you know, can, can be a, a game changer from having to manipulate a mouse or something like that. Um, and, and kind of the one, one big downside I would say is, you know, again, lack of control over, uh, uh, exact control over what it's gonna look like if you're a designer and um, image positioning, I think has always been pretty difficult. Okay, so um, why are fluid layout EPUBs uh, more accessible than uh, print? So um, <clears throat> a lot of folks have print disabilities, which um, is a broad category for folks who experience a barrier to accessing print materials in non-specialized formats. So they might have a significant visual impairment like low vision or blindness, a learning disability such as dyslexia or an attention issues. Some readers may have a condition, condition that makes it difficult or impossible to physically hold and position a print object for reading. So uh, EPUBs can mitigate uh, all of those things um, by providing someone with a visual impairment with the ability to change the text size, uh, to specify the font, which some folks uh, who have dyslexia find that um, uh, it's less of a problem in some fonts than others. So being able to specify the font can make a big difference. Um, the text is unlike a print object, the text is machine read readable. So it uh, can be converted, uh, uh, can be read by screen readers, which um, are obviously used by blind readers, but also can supplement um, someone who has uh, low vision. Um, and in some cases can be converted to braille, uh, can be converted to audio and, and so on. So um, even though we've got uh, EPUB, a lot of EPUB 2s in our collection often, why, why do we care about EPUB 3.0? Um, and I'm gonna be saying things again, very similar to what Alyssa was talking about. Um, it uh, has better semantics. Um, it has those sort of uh, the newer uh, you know, uh, tags that, uh, uh, she was referring to such as, um, you know, nav and things like that, that we we're already familiar with from our web projects. Um, it has ARIA roles for more precise description of contents or it supports ARIA roles rather. Um, for math lovers, it's got math ML um, and it has uh, richer audio and video media capabilities uh, and can do synchronized audio. Okay, so um, I, if I were in person, I'd ask how many of you have cracked open an EPUB and looked inside? Um, but uh, I'll just uh, say that uh, it's easy. Um, so you've got a document that's .epub. Uh, if you've got it on your PC, you just change the .epub uh, file extension to .zip, and then you unzip it, uh, and you will get a set of uh, folders and files um, that, uh, that make up uh, the, the ebook, which in essence is a mini website for reading on on certain kinds of devices. Um, so uh, if you're on a Mac, um, you can use, a, the tool that I use is Ecan Crusher um, and uh, provide a link to that in the resources and you basically just drop it on that icon and it'll, it'll open it up for you. So when you get in, what you're gonna see are is a folder structure um, and some files. Um, because of the uh, brevity of this talk, I'm just gonna talk about a couple of them. Uh, mostly in what's called the OEBS folder or the books folder. Um, this is, stands for open ebook public structure, but, but uh, ebook designers call it the book folder. Um, and in there, uh, there's a file uh, called content. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble seeing my own notes here. Uh, uh, Content.opf. Uh, and that file, um, um, it's one of the things that it contains is the sort of, is the metadata, right? Um, so one of the things that you can do to uh, improve the accessibility of uh, an EPUB or to check to see, you know, how much care someone has taken who's made an EPUB that you want to share with others, you know, or make part of your collection is to look at the, you know, what metadata did they provide? Um, so the property, uh, there's a number of properties that you can identify to make it easier for, uh, the reader to know what to expect. Uh, so for example, for example, here we see um, 
accessibility hazard, no flashing. So if I'm someone who uh, has a problem with uh, flashing causing seizures, I wanna know right off the bat whether or not this uh, text reading the, engaging with this EPUB is gonna cause any problems for me. So um, that's a very easy way to make, to make uh, your EPUB more accessible. Um, so the access mode property, uh, you can indicate, hey, there's text here, this is textual content. Visual, this contains visual content, such as images, graphics, diagrams, animations, and video. Auditory, this contains auditory content, such as standalone audio clips and audio soundtracks for video content. Even tactile, this contains tactile content, such as embedded braille and tactile diagrams. And then another property you can assign is accessibility feature. You can more specifically say, hey, uh, this thing has um, uh, long descriptions, for example, which you're probably you know, familiar with from, from websites, as opposed to uh, only shorter descriptions of, of uh, diagrams and visual things. Or um, this thing contains an audio description. And as I mentioned before, an accessibility hazard. Flashing, so uh, anything that flashes more than three times a second can cause seizures in some folks. So we wanna let them know uh, that that's not there or cer certainly if it's there. Um, I believe um, Alyssa alluded to motion simulation uh, with, with vertical scrolling or the motion of vertical uh, scrolling causing a kind of motion sickness. So some people are very sensitive to motion. So if you've got you know a video in your ebook that simulates motion, you should probably tell people. And sound. Uh, letting people know if you're going to, if it has sort of ringing and buzzing. And so folks that can also cause seizures. So uh, good to let them know. And I'm going to, oh yeah. Um, and uh, the last kind of metadata trait in there that, that uh, is good to use is just a kind of summary of the accessibility features uh, in, in, in addition to kind of itemizing the, the individual properties. So for example, you might indicate, hey, this, we provided short descriptions. Uh, for uh, visual stuff, but we're not we're not providing long descriptions, and that that way the user can decide whether or not they want to engage uh, with that uh, EPUB or how they want to engage with that. Okay, so um, with the time that I have left, a uh, few, few minutes, I'm going to talk about things you can do in the actual content files, which in EPUB are uh, XHTML files, although they they use the kind of again the more structured semantic markup. Um, but all this means for folks who, who don't work with that is just, you know, uh, it's a little, it's a little stricter um, and like you have to close your tags and things like that and be based out of XML, but um, pretty much, you know, if you're already familiar with it, with HTML, you're going to be fine. Okay, and I too am going to mention instruction semantics. Matt Garish is an editor at the DAISY Consortium and works on uh, W3C and EPUB 3.0 standards, and he says structure is the elements you use to craft your EPUB content and semantics is the additional meaning you can layer on top of those structures to better indicate what they represent. So I'm, I used the same example as a previous speaker, um, a footer. We used to use div ID footer and anything could uh, in the world could go in between uh, those quotation marks after the ID. Now we have something that, that clearly indicates the structure that you know, screen readers understand and uh, can respond to uh, the footer tag. So, uh, EPUB 3 allows you to use structural tags like section, nav, side, header, age group, things like that. Uh, it also allows the use, uh, supports ARIA rules. So um, attributes that allow you to apply more precise meanings to generic, generic HTML tags. You can define chunks of content, add a layer of additional meaning, and this helps assistive technologies to navigate a document by identifying regions and structures. So this is an example of uh, in an, uh, how you might uh, apply that. So here we're using the section tag uh, to indicate that this section of the EPUB has to, is the endnotes for the, for the book. Um, so we use section and um, uh, role equals doc dash endnotes. So hey, this is, these are the endnotes. Uh, and then we use this aria labeled by, um, which says this section is labeled by hd dash notes. And then if we look at the next line, we have an h1 header. Um, and that H1 header has been assigned the same uh, characters as ARIA labeled by HD notes. So it tells us very clearly, tells the screen reader, hey, this H1 isn't just a header one, it's in fact uh, a header one that designates the, um, that is a header for this entire section um, that has the role doc and notes. Uh, so that can be useful. And then let's see, how much time? One minute. All right. So, um, uh, 
another thing that you can pay attention to is you know tag choice. So this is an example of uh, uh, a short story in which uh, you got some dialogue, and this this guy says the question is not your of your strength but of my art, and that's uh, emphasized. So we all know to use an em tag for that. A screen reader will read that with emphasis. But here's another case. Uh, the Don didn't mix much with us, taking aperitivo at the end in that first line. That word aperitivo is italicized here in the visual display, not because it's to be emphasized, but because it's in a language other than the primary language of the text. It's in Italian. So, um, you know, if you're being conscientious about your uh, uh, content and making it accessible to screen readers, for example, you would use an I tag rather than an emphasis tag. Um, and you would indicate very clearly, as you can see here, class, lang, and XML language, hey, this thing is in Italian. And a screen reader will know that and will read that with uh, the pronunciation rules appropriate to Italian. And then uh, same example in the same category of just some italicized text. Um, here, uh, Libro dell'Arte del Danzer, which I'm mispronouncing, I am sure, but I'm using the site tag. I'm indicating, I'm gonna stop my timer, the reason that I have, it happens to be in Italian, but the reason which this text is being represented visually in italics is because it is a citation, not because it is intended to be read with emphasis. Um, there are many, 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 we're just scratching the surface, but um, I'm very excited about what EPUB 3 uh, has, does to extend our ability uh, as folks with just kind of, you know, basic uh, uh, HTML knowledge, you don't have to be uh, a kind of, you know, master web developer or ebook publisher to figure out ways to make it easier for folks with uh, disabilities to engage with your content. So I appreciate uh, everything. Thanks so much. All right, so like I said, I'm Kate Dybul and let's get into this. So some of you might recognize a little bit of, if you're of the older generation, you know, I'm gonna say 80s in here, you might recognize a classic commercial from my title. You know, the good old Reese's Pieces, uh, Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Hey, you got chocolate in my peanut butter. Hey, you got peanut butter in my chocolate. Two great tastes, taste great together. And this is actually a pretty good metaphor for what I'm talking about here. The, so, I mean, I love peanut butter. I love chocolate. I loved accessibility. I love diversity, equity, and inclusion work. And so, yes, I do think that accessibility should be involved with DEI work. But I have to say this, I really hate chocolate and peanut butter together. So now that I've shocked you all and you can just ignore me because of the hatred, um, I still wanna say this, you know, the, the point is there, diversity and representation are important but often underappreciated aspects of describing images of people. And where this comes from is, I'm talking about alt text, alternative text. I don't kind of just fly through a reminder of what this is. This is metadata that's used to describe an image. And it's usually often used for low vision or blind users. It's sometimes if a browser fails to load an image, it will put in the alt text so you know what should have been there. And sometimes it's actually used in document and web searching. It has a lot of power. And in HTML, it's often put in the image tag under alt. And even a lot of programs like Office, uh, you know, InDesign, all of these now let you put edit alt text in there. So it's relatively easier and easier to add alt text, but there's still a, an alt text crisis. In 2021, WebAIM, a major accessibility um, organization, did a study of the homepages of the top 1 million websites. And they found that 
on these home pages, 23.2% of them had missing alternative text. And this was ruling out decorative images. And 10.4% of those images had alternate alternative text that was rather questionable. They might say things like image, graphic, they were a file name, blank. None of that was helpful. So one third of alt text is theoretically missing. So, but it's also important to recognize that alt text is hard and tricky. And, you know, and there's a lot of challenges to it. First of all, it needs to be concise, but descriptive. You, you can, you, you have to find the balance between writing too much and writing too little. So too short of alt text may miss the most important salient aspects of the image. Too long and a screen reader user can say, I don't wanna hear a thousand words for every picture, skip over the alt text. And at what point should a, the descriptions of an image in alt really be something that you put out there to become descriptive text, like in a caption that every user can benefit from? Remember, alt text is usually not available to a lot of people unless you're using specialty software. And so, I mean, and I'm going to have links to a lot of great articles here. And here's a big thing. A lot of people think there's a character limit. There is no character limit. That's a myth. There used to be one but there isn't anymore. Alt text is also very, very hard. It's not just a description, but it's you have to make it relevant to the context. You can't just write alt text once and just reuse it all the time. There's always a little bit of context and you take an advantage there. I mean, you could describe everything, but you really need to be concise. It should highlight what is relevant for your discussion. And this is, of all the articles that I say, this article, Context is the Most Critical Aspect of Alt Text Everyone Seems to Miss by Sherry Byrne Haber. If you only read one thing, read that. If you have to read alt text, read that there. And my slides are up in OSF. Uh, also, alt text is hard from the point of distance. The people who are writing alt text are usually not the people who took the image or chose the image. So they weren't present when the photo was taken. They weren't involved in the creation of the graphic or chart. They don't, they don't know enough to, ask, to know why it was. And so they might just be like trying to infer it and they can get that wrong quite a bit. Now let's talk about what I really wanna talk about, writing good alt text for, for headshots. And yes, some of this thinking influenced, influenced this conference's uh, speaker page. So the reason why I wanna focus on headshots is because it really constrains the situation. The images are simple, it's one person. The purpose and context is very, very clear. It's to show that person. The subject of the picture is most likely alive and contactable. So that actually can play a role in this too. There's just a lot of good value to it. And let's also focus on two visual, visible aspects of diversity, race and gender. Now, there are other visible aspects too that we could talk about, but first of all, this is a 20 minute talk and I'm barely gonna make 20 minutes. Plus also, these are two of the most common ones that come up in kind of what people are talking about in this. Now, diversity in headshots also matters a lot. Um, if you think about it, the headshot is actually there to represent who is in your conference, who is in your business. So. As a sighted users, we uh, sighted users can quickly identify how many women are speaking at a conference. Is this conference, you know, is this company's uh, board of executives all white men? Sorry for the white men out here, but you, that's the stereotype. But if you're actually blind or low vision or using alt text, if it just says their names or doesn't describe race or gender, you can't ascertain that diversity. And there are actually a lot of people who talk about the value of this. And really a lot of this started from a particular blog post that started in August. This has been something I've been thinking about roughly for the last, I guess, nine months. There was a really good, I'll say this blog post was really good. It, it brought up an interesting idea that when you're talking about people in, in, in alt text, describe their emotions. Don't just say they're smiling. Make it clear, is it a little bit of cheekiness in the smile? Is it a bit of a trickster? Is it a forced because you need a smile in photos? That conveys a lot of good stuff. I love that part of it. But then it had this section with a heading called, should skin color be mentioned in alt text? 
these were what it said. In the context of a conference, if the speaker is talking about JavaScript performance, it seems unnecessary to bring race into it. Followed by, but if the speaker is talking about their experience of prejudice in the tech industry, that changes the context. So apparently your race only matters as a conference speaker if you're talking about your race. That's, I could go on a lot about it, but this is very much erasing the reality of what happens with gender and race in a lot of, uh, in a lot of conferences, fields and all that. Now, also, I have worked in the accessibility industry. I worked as an accessibility consultant for several months this past year. And a similar question about headshots for staff directory came up. And this was interesting. So checking my time, need to speed up a little. So from this conversation, there are all sorts of things. Some things were good. Race and gender are important. And if you omit them, people will default to whatever is most common. So that's usually white and a man. And if you get them wrong in the alt text, that is really, really bad. So you should not guess. But then they say, well, you know, in order to not guess, we should just report skin color and gender performance. I'll get into that more later. And really some things were confusing. I said like, well, it's a staff directory. Why couldn't you just ask your staff people how they want to identify themselves? And I was told, well, in general, for all the images in the world, you can't generally ask, there's the subject's opinion. So that doesn't apply, which I'm like, because you can't do it in a broad sense, but specific context, you can, you can't do that. So confusing. And then there was uh, this one, I'll just read it. Never mention race and gender ever as the terms change too fast and alt text might not be updated often enough. I mean, yeah, that's an interesting one there. Things are changing too fast. Society should go stay the way it is. But this is actually one of the critical things. This is actually a pretty common opinion in the accessibility community. All text should reflect what a sighted person sees, even if that leads to the same mistakes and misperceptions that a sighted person could make. So this means that if you misidentify race, you misgender someone, that should also be replicated in all text, which as a person who promotes social justice through technology, I had some questions on it. What if getting it wrong is bad? Why is that different and okay in this sense? Is it, you know, you can think about this. Is there this uh, what's meant by the difference between equality and equity? And yeah, a lot of difficult questions. And these are just some of the good guides I found or readings I've done. So let's jump into race, checking time, about on schedule. So first of all, I have to say this, I am a white person. I am not the person who should really be talking about race and alter, alternate text. A lot of the opinions and stuff, I, I lack the cultural perspective and sensitivity to fully grasp the issues involved. I need, I'm trying to be aware of my privilege here. So I'm just going to share what the current practices are and what some of the comments that have been made. So it's important when doing this work to, to be able to recognize what you know, how you, you know, what's your, what are your power privileges related to all this? So, as I said, it focuses on skin tones. It focuses on talking about skin color. That is all that is talked about, skin color. And there is actually a set vocabulary that's determined by what's called the Fitzpatrick scale. So this is a medical scale developed in 1975 for determining your sensitivity to ultraviolet light. It's used for various forms of phototherapy to figure out your dosage. And it's based upon a heuristic uh, determined by your skin type, hair color, eye color, and also kind of how you react to sun. So this is sort of a table breaking it down. I'm not gonna go into a full description, but I just wanna describe what it means for me. There are six levels, uh, pale, fair, average, light brown, brown, and black. And so where I fall, my skin, I am very pale and I have freckles. Although if you see me in person, they're hard to see because I have to avoid sun for other reasons. I also burn super easily. I have never tanned in my life. So that puts me at a level one. But my hair is actually very dark brown to black, which kind of puts me at a level four or five. And my eyes, honestly, I really don't know what my eyes are. It's only about a two to three. 
I've actually had this assessment for because so, I've had to have phototherapy. It put me at a three or four based upon the heuristic, which my doctors immediately determined, no, we're going to start you out on a lower dose because we have a feeling we're probably going to fry your skin. So it's not perfect. It's a medical heuristic. It works for a lot of people, but not everyone. And, oh, this did not come through too well. Um, but actually, you, sh you actually have experienced this. So on the emojis, you know, those skin tones you get, that's actually based on the Fitzpatrick scale. They just combined levels one and two into one because it's hard to determine the difference. But so these are the skin tones that you're supposed to use for describing race. Pale skin, cream skin, moderate brown, dark brown, and black skin. And this is kind of some things that people have said. It really seems weird to re reduce race to just sim skin color because it oversimplifies a lot of racial identity. And there are several things in here. It's like uh, you can kind of condense all of Asia into just moderate brown to dark brown. That's not really telling you much. You just say someone has brown skin. Uh, focusing on skin color actually incorrectly suggests some people's racial identities. The classic example are actually fair-skinned African-Americans who still experience the same uh, social um, impacts that take place in this country, despite the fact that they might have a cream-colored skin or light brown skin. There are multiple criticisms of the emoji skin tones as well, because five things to address uh, representation, it's not exactly the best. And of course, the full Fitzpatrick scale, sometimes people point out there are three levels for white people. That doesn't seem right, but only one for really black people. But that's because it's about ultraviolet light and melanin, not related to you know, the vast sociocultural history that has determined races. And these are some readings. I'm doing okay. So gender in alt text, let's get into gender. Now, this, I have to say something else. I have some privilege here in talking about this. I am a trans woman. I have lived as my true self for 20 years. August will be my birthday in a sense. And I will tell you that every day of my life, I still experience dysphoria and fear of being misgendered. It's part of just my life. And I can tell you that the latest rounds of anti-transgender legislation throughout this country has not helped that. I felt safer during the George W. Bush administration. And I just want to say this, please don't come up to me and say, oh, you are clearly a woman or a girl, you pass well. You're not actually going to be helping me. It's something that's barely, it's, it's actually part of my identity. It's something that a lot of trans people go through. It's, it's part of it. It kind of sucks that we do, but, uh, you know, it gives me some perspective. So in this case, what all the guides seem to recommend is focusing on gender performance. And by this, it means like describe the clothing and accessories, you know, focus on like hair and skin, wearing their makeup, jewelry, or things like the describe their body shape, if they have facial hair. And a lot of this is associated with common cultural gender roles. And particularly the Cooper Hewitt guidelines, which are cited by a lot of people for good guides on writing alt tech. And these are good in some ways, but they have, these are things that it says. Oh, by the way, Cooper Hewitt is a sub museum of the Smithsonian. It's like the museum of design, I think. So no assumptions should be made about the gender of a person. Where gender is clearly performed, it should be described. When unknown, a person should be described using they, them, and person. Unless gender performance is being described, then you assign she or he. Now notice how throughout this, though, they never describe what gender performance is. So, you know, let's go to the person who developed her. Oh, and this is one of their examples where they're like, oh, clearly that's a man and a woman. Gender is so being performed here. Well, here's the problem. Per Judith Butler, the coiner of the term, gender is always being performed in that we control our visage, how we look, and our actions to express our gender identity. And that is true for cisgender men, cisgender women. It's true for non-binary people, people who you know, kind of define their own gender. And here's the thing, it doesn't map clearly to specific genders. You know, now, I know more men who wear, who wear, I know men who wear more makeup than I do, and I wear none. 
And here's the other thing too, the Cooper Hewitt guidelines assumes a gender binary is that it's man or woman or really unknown. And it's not unknown or in the sense of non-binary, it's just like, oh, we don't know. And they don't discuss the existence of trans people at all in there. And these are actually fairly recent, like from like five years ago. And here's some other things too, and focusing on performance, it kind of is completely erasing the notions of that there's more than the than binary gender. And because of all people who are sort of falling outside of the norms of gender performance are trans people, this means that these guidelines will misgender non-binary people um, in all texts the most. So it's actually persecutory against them. Okay, two minutes. But importantly, this isn't just about transgender people. Here's an example from Code for Lib. So on, this, on screen here is a picture of Chris Borg, the director of MIT Libraries. Chris is an out and proud, openly butch, lesbian, cisgender woman. So this, this picture of Chris Borg is she is a white woman, you know, in her 50s, who has gray short cropped hair, is wearing men's, what are traditionally called men's clothes, a really nice button down shirt, tie, and a suit vest all pretty much very impeccably um, tailored. By the way, the name Chris is also rather gender ambiguous. Could be Christ Christopher, could be Christina. And she regularly gets misgendered. By the way, Chris uh, Borg was the 2018 opening keynote. So this is part of our gr group here. And so yeah, 2020 on Twitter, she got misgendered. The person realized it and apologized though. And Chris has actually written about these issues. And here's just one of those. And here's some additional thoughts on gender and all text. A lot of times when people like learn that someone's trans, they'll actually like focus on what parts pass and what parts don't. So you get this extra level of scrutiny. And I really don't know exactly how would you put say trans woman in all text? Do I need to say trans woman or do I just say as I usually do a geek lady or geek girl? And really, we need a study of this. There's a bunch of studies about race and alt text. There's no like group studies focusing on trans opinions here. We need that. And if you're interested in it, talk to me. So just to wrap this up, I am at 22 seconds. I have advice on what to write. Describe their person, ask them to consider mentioning their gender, race, anything else, and there's that. But alt text is hard. And there are a lot of complex questions we need to work on. But really, let's keep mixing DEI and accessibility, but keep chocolate and peanut butter separate. So I will happily take questions on Slack, and we need to move on to the next person who I have to take a look at my screen to see who that is. Never volunteer for the, se for the session that you are presenting in. It it's tiring. So next up is Ab uh, Abigail Gobin, Sebastian Karcher, and Randy Colon in Actually Accessible Data, A Call to Action. Well, oh, that was up really fast. Hello, good Whenever afternoon, everyone. Is my sound all right? Yes. All right. Thank you, Kate. Randy, can you check your sound real quick? Hello, hear me okay? Perfect. Yep, you're great. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those of you who are following along on Twitter, I didn't have internet an hour ago. So that's been fun, um, but we have internet again. So this is an actually accessible data, a call to action. And um, I am delighted to be here today with two of my colleagues, uh, Randy Collin, who is a PhD in disability studies at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Um, he's a research assistant at ADA Park and a disability advocate and one of my former students. Um, for those of you I have not met, I'm Abigail Gobin. I'm the data management librarian, data policy advisor, and an associate professor at UIC. I use she and her pronouns. And our third collaborator is Sebastian Karcher, who is the Associate Director of the Qualitative Data Repository and a Research Assistant Professor of Political Science at Syracuse University. 
So when we started this conversation, um, Sebastian and I were chatting and we were talking about the idea of data accessibility and what did that mean? And almost immediately, we came up with the challenge that there are at least five different definitions for the word accessibility when we're talking about data. I believe we've identified one or two more, but these are the five that we started with. Data is in a format and location where it can be retrieved. This could be a repository, this could be your desktop. It really, it's, it kind of varies. Data can be downloaded by a new user after discovery. So moving past just identifying where, where it is to can we download it and actually do something with that data? Is there, is there some kind of limitation? The third definition draws on what we would consider the accessibility piece of the FAIR principles, where data can be accessed by machines or in an automated fashion, right? They use accessible, they never, they, they only really talk about, they prioritize computer access to data. The fourth definition looks at the paywalls. And I know I don't have to explain the challenge of, social, of scholarly communication and the paywalls to you. We're seeing that in the data world right now where data is moving behind socioeconomic limitations, or we see the difference between what's happening in the global West or the global South. Where we wanted to focus though, and what our consideration was, is the definition that data is easily used by everyone, including disabled people. So that's the death when we say accessibility, unless I correct to one of these other four definitions, that's the definition we're gonna speak about today. And I'm gonna pass it over to Randy. Thanks, Abigail. Uh, unfortunately, I've missed many of the talks going on in this conference, but reading through the titles, I can tell that accessibility, inclusion, and disability uh, seems to be on a lot of people's minds, which is commendable uh, and appropriate, given that worldwide about a billion people have a disability, uh, and in the U. S, uh, according to the CDC, over one in four adults have a disability. So it's a lot of people to think about. Um, and I'll add too, given some earlier talks as well, that even if someone doesn't have a disability today, they may have one tomorrow. So it could be something that could affect you or someone you know, either now or in the near future. Keeping that in mind, it's also worth noting that there's nothing inherently inaccessible about data or programs or pretty much anything that could be accessed on the computer. If we think about codes, they are in essence numbers and symbols, and it's how we arrange these numbers and symbols that often determines whether something is accessible to a person with a disability like myself. So I will say here that we have a ethical and moral duty to include disabled people for its own sake and for the significant portion it makes up of the population. Uh, next slide, please. And while I'll always stress that disability should be included for its own sake, I'll also throw in a little bit of the financial ramifications that are possible if accessibility guidelines are not adhered to. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, we live in a pretty litigious society where there really there are accessibility laws and policies that should be followed. Um, it can sometimes be hard to follow and they often change, but failing to make things accessible for certain institutions can lead to a lawsuit, which can cost your institution money and resources. Uh, on the flip side, if you are putting something out there, you're a vendor, a provider, um, there are institutions with librarians and disability advocates who are calling for 
their institutions to only work with vendors who provide accessible material. So if you yourself aren't putting out accessible material, there can be institutions who do not want to work with you. Um, keep in mind too that typically it's easier to work, make things accessible from the beginning than it is to go back and retrofit it in later, either due to a lawsuit or because an institution you want to work with requires it. So it could be in you or your institution's financial and professional interest to build in accessibility as early in as possible. Next slide, please. So doing a little bit of a carrot and a stick routine, um, besides fin financial potential financial ramifications and ethical and moral obligations, making things more accessible can improve products and services overall. So if we think, for instance, about low vision or partially sighted people, again, like myself, um, a lot of times when we're thinking about accessibility, in essence, we're at least a big part of it is thinking about how to make things easier to see. So I ask who doesn't want things to be easy to see? Um, it seems like maybe a common sense, maybe a little flippant way to approach things. But if we also think about it, a lot of the guidelines for making material and products more visually accessible, also make things more accessible for people with learning disabilities, especially dyslexia. So by thinking through this element of accessibility, we're not just benefiting with this one subgroup, but are potentially benefiting many people. Uh, thinking about PDFs, uh, we often uh, publish our papers and PDFs and whatnot. Um, making it accessible to a screen reader user means that the screen reader user can have all the elements on the PDF read out loud to them. Now I'll say making this possible for a screen reader user also makes it possible for all people. And I can say as a PhD student, now candidate, that a lot of students do like to listen to PDFs on the go, so that by increasing accessibility for this specific group again, we're creating more options for more people. And then scaling back again to screen readers, taking a slightly deeper dive. Uh, for those who don't know, in essence, a screen reader reads all the elements on a computer or other electronic device out loud to the individual. And the traditional way to navigate what a sighted person will normally see on the screen is to use a keyboard. So if we're thinking about accessibility for a screen reader user, we're often thinking about how to remove clutter and make it easier for a user to navigate from one important element to another. So I'll ask again, who does decluttering and easy navigation benefit? So of course, the screen reader user, like I just mentioned, but also people with learning disabilities, especially dyslexia, also potentially people with intellectual disabilities, but also we can argue just the general user. Um, anyone who isn't an expert, say, in your uh, library search catalog or whatever program or website that we need to use to access your data and services will want an easy entry to be able to use it. So by thinking through accessibility, we're potentially not just helping screen reader users like myself, but making our products more usable and easier to access for mo many, if not all people. Um, and to talk a little bit more about the progress we've made on accessibility or lack thereof so far and some next steps we can implement, I'll hand the reins back over to Abigail. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Randy. So 
Because of Sebastian and I's work, my work in research data management, Sebastian's work with qualitative data, uh, the qualitative data repository, we focused on this for ourselves from a data repository and data access perspective. So we're both facing all of these data obligations. Um, if you've spoken to me in the last 18 months, you know that the only thing I'm thinking about is the NIH data sharing policy. And it raised the question of where are our repositories? When we talk about, are they accessible? Do they have these features and options? Where are our standards? Where are our curation guides? What's even out there? So we set out to identify some of that. And we'll start here with the repositories. You can see um, these tests were run. They are the wave tests and we're aware of the limitations of those, but they're a starting place for us. Uh, certainly not, this, is, this is a floor, not, not where we wanna get to, but you can see immediately OSF, which we're using for this conference, has some very particular accessibility challenges within the repository software itself. Harvard Dataverse similarly had a number of problems. Come back to that in a second. On the flip side, Figshare and Dryad, which a number of us use for our institutional repositories, for our data repositories, UIC is a Figshare shop. Um, we're starting, they, they're doing a little better with WAVE. Now I'm delighted to report, we've been working on this for about a year together, and I'm delighted to report that because of our beginning efforts, Harvard Dataverse in response to work with QDR has made significant improvements. We've been able to advocate and Sebastian and his team have been able to advocate for immediate improvements. So this is looking better already, but we haven't had a chance to update and rerun these tests. Where we are in terms of standards, in terms of data, these will probably sound familiar. Everyone talks about the FAIR principles and the CARE principles. Nothing in here addresses accessibility from the perspective and the definition that we are using. That's a problem. That is a huge problem because if we're talk if we're codifying in, in law and in policy, federal policy codifies fair and care, and it does not mention accessibility. All the things related to the NIH data sharing policy that goes into effect next January, nothing in there says anything about accessibility for researchers other than meeting basic web accessibility. It's just not there. And then there's what's in our own houses. We've, you know, we look at OSF and we look at Figshare, we look at FAIR and CARE, those are kind of external to us. What's within our own work as data librarians and data curators? Again, we don't have accessibility in the data curation spec kit, in most of our data curation primers. The data curation primer for R that's from the DCN network, does talk about accessibility. We want to make sure that we highlight that and also Cornell University's e-commons. So we do have a couple of examples of how you could do this and how you could include this, but it's not universal yet by any stretch. And it is absolutely a problem because then that's not part of what we're teaching. It is not part of how we are engaging with the data that's coming into our repositories. It's a huge gap. This is an enormous challenge. The data, when I say data, everybody's like, what kind? So all the different kinds of data and all the myriad op options we have, what, what can we do now? What are the first steps that we can take? We are not here today to give you all of the solutions because that's going to take all of us and a lot of people and a lot of ideas. But these are a couple that we can start with, some low hanging fruit that we can begin to work towards. One is to look at your data repository. Is it meeting those accessibility issues, the basic web accessibility issues? If you're on Harvard Dataverse, please reach out to Sebastian and, and see what else we can do to improve. How do we advocate to OSF to make the work that we're presenting today accessible more broadly? Um, Figshare, we have to hold them accountable. Same with Dryad. 
we've heard already in this session some discussion about the accessibility of common data formats. And there are some tools that help us quickly test for accessibility um, with Microsoft Office, with PDF. There's a couple of things that we can do that at least hit some of that low hanging fruit, at least get you started. And also it helps with good data curation practices. If we're not doing things like relying on red text and yellow highlights to look at the data, we're actually spelling things out in different columns. It's better for data curation, it's better for data reuse, and it's better for data accessibility. And then finally, we want to proactively make sure we're thinking about supplementary accessibility information for audiovisual data. We have our captioner here today. We also wanna think about transcriptions. Automated transcription services have gotten so much better. It's what I use for my data course and my data lectures. I have to go in and clean those up, absolutely. But we have options and tools now that do make this a lot easier. And they're things that we can show people and encourage them to work with right away. So this is our call to action. This is our ask of you to go back and think about at your institutions, how can we mainstream accessibility in our data curation practice and our guidance? How can we improve the curation guides that we generate and the instruction that we give around data curation? We can choose accessible vendors and tools and hold accountable the ones, we don't have to give them money. We usually have options to not give money to people who are not meeting these accessibility needs and who are not engaged with us in ensuring that everyone will be able to access and use the materials we want them to have access to. And then we want to include disabled people as developers, designers, and testers. The earlier that you can involve them in the process, the easier it is to catch the things that might trip someone up that might prevent them from being able to move forward and to access things. Um, finally, we will be absolutely happy to take questions in the Slack channel. We also have a preprint of a forthcoming paper related to this topic. I will be dropping a DOI to that in the Slack channel if you'd like to download and read that. And our contact information is there. And thank you so much for the time today. Okay, we are done with this session, but before we go to break, I have a few announcements. Just let me get set up. Yeah. Uh, so da, 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 there we are. So we have an afternoon break until three o'clock. Two of our morning Zoom talks are rescheduled to be at the top of the lightning talks block. So the first one uh, will be Ju Julia Caffrey Hill talking about Unlikely Allies, the Textbook Affordability, Python Bookstore Data, and, and a Discovery API, followed by Wesley Teal, Automation as a Pathway Towards Slow Librarianship. Uh, there are still apparently seven talk slots left for the Lightning Talks. So please, if you have a talk in mind, sign up and make sure if, you, if you're going to use slides, please bring them down here. We'll need them before the uh, next session starts. So. You know, I know you want to go for break, but prioritize getting your slides here. And the flip chart for tomorrow's uh, morning's lightning talks is already outside. So you have a lot more advanced time to think about it. That is all. Enjoy a break.
Joya, can you, are you ready? Yep, ready. Yep, just go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay, great. I'm gonna assume you can hear me fine and everything, just call out if you cannot. Okay, hi everybody. My name is Julia Caffrey Hill and I'm web services librarian at Towson University. And I'm excited to share with you today Unlikely Allies of Textbook Affordability, and it's a story of Python, bookstore data, and a discovery API. Um, so I believe we all support uh, the, the uh, journey toward textbooks and course materials generally being available uh, for our students um, and for those to be available equitably um, and the the cost is tremendous. Uh, as a student myself, as an undergraduate, um, I was dependent on course reserves and spent a lot of time in my library um, being reading those. And there's so many other ways we can support textbook affordability right now, which is why I was so excited when um, my colleagues and I were given this quest from our new Dean, Susanna Yaki from Sacramento State University who wanted to create uh, a web page that they had at Sacramento State University that listed all required and recommended course books for each semester on their website. Not just course reserves, but any open educational resources, any uh, licensed uh, content that had appropriate terms of the license to be able to be used in this type of context. So, uh, we set out trying to make this, and as you can imagine, it's not just data from uh, any of the siloed um, parts of what we offer, it's kind of everything. And it also is dependent on information about the university's course catalog. So that brings me to our earliest unlikely ally in creating this, which was bookstore system data. And you might expect that uh, the bookstore might be reluctant to share their data uh, because they want to sell course books, right? Uh, but actually our bookstore is independently operated. It's not part of Barnes and Noble or anything like that. And most of their revenue comes from selling university merchandise. Uh, so, <clears throat> So they were willing to share their data, but it ended up coming to us in this form. So I'm sharing uh, now a screenshot of a text file that uses ASCII characters as formatting and a lot of white space as formatting. And it's a table with author and uh, ISBN and title fields without, with a lot of abbreviations and uh, things that make it difficult to uh, process in a programmatic way. We did uh, work closely with our central IT office um, to uh, try to get a data extract in CSV format. And eventually we did. We were successful in getting that uh, from them, filtered by semester. Uh, and we ended up with six sorry, 9,618 rows of bookstore data, all still very dirty. So very much uh, titles that if you plugged into our discovery layer, wouldn't bring up anything. And um, so ISBN and maybe author were really the best we could do in terms of the data we could use. Which brings us to our next unlikely ally, our discovery API. Uh, while Sacramento State University, where we're borrowing this vision from, uses Primo, we use EDS, EBSCO Discovery Service, uh, which can also search by ISBN and return multiple results and permanent links for each. Uh, and, but that's not really what we're looking for here. We're looking for a single permanent URL because if we just link the user to the search results, it's a lot and it 
contains a lot of book reviews and chapters of books that aren't really the item. And we didn't really have the staffing to resolve that kind of giant Gordian knot of, of issues. So uh, we needed something else to come in and help us bring everything together, which brings me to the last um, ally and the real hero of the project, Python. Uh, so I wrote a script that parses the bookstore data uh, with its dirt and all and um, checks for unique ISBN. So it makes a kind of a list of unique ISBNs. Um, it's not searching every row because as you might imagine, across the university with a lot of sections, there's a lot of duplicate course materials. And then also uh, searches by ISBN and author in some ways using our search parameters that we scoped out for this project. And then most importantly, matches that information back onto the um, course book data so that the URL and uh, some other information that helps our staff is right there in the same row as what professor and what section, et cetera. Um, so that makes it ready for our staff to review for licensing considerations or whether we really have full access or not. Um, and the project was great. I had only done one other pro project in Python before that was really building a, a web application. So it was a very different project. And uh, maybe the most interesting thing code-wise I learned was Python list comprehensions, which I don't run into as more of a web developer user experience type. Um, so that was really fun. Um, so now I'd like to give a live demo. And yes, I am that adventurous. Uh, so what could possibly go wrong? I'll try not to let uh, Trogdor trigger the fire alarm as I do this. Um, please un unmute and tell me if this is not showing up on the screen and I'll enlarge it if I can. Okay, so to run the script, it's Python 3, name of the file, the CSV you want to run, and then uh, the semester code. And this is uploaded to GitHub and linked from the OSF uh, project page as well. So what it did there first was authenticate into the EDS um, system, which you can work out with your EBSCO representative. And then uh, right now it's searching by a small sample of rows of data uh, of, for by its each unique ISBN and showing the total results of each. You can now put anything you want um, from what EBSCO's API returns, but uh, this is kind of what I enjoyed watching tick by. And so I plan to run this every semester once the, the data comes through from, from central IT and then provide this information back to um, our e-resources staff so that they can process it. And now that's completed running. Again, that was like a selection of, of the rows. Um, and I do include the sample data in uh, the repository. And so um, and just open that. So this is what, I didn't show you what, what I had before, but it was basically the first, um, first couple columns up to here. And I apologize if this is small, let's see. Um, so what it appends on there, you can see our proxied URL here, um, very long, and our um, what database it comes from and the ebook. And that's repeated across any of them where there's a search result that's being returned. Um, I'll leave it there for time and just show you the end results of the web page. So, uh, I then import the CSV into Drupal and um, the user can enjoy access to their course materials at no cost to them through the library. 
Um, what I would say is I'd prefer this user journey to be um, to be part of the journey of buying a textbook or or enrolling in a class is is that's where they'd encounter this information instead of a siloed web page on uh, a course uh, on a library website. But I believe there are others that are thinking about that, like Drexel, I think, is is kind of investigating that at least according to uh, Courtney and McAllister of EBSCO, they were working on that last year. Um, jumping back to my slides here, um, some of the outcomes. As a result of the script, we are saving 15 hours of staff time each semester. That's an estimate from one of my colleagues who was going through manually. Um, and we were able to launch the Coursebooks page using this automation um, with 400 plus listings of free to student course materials for fall semester of 2021. Um, and that would have been in the 20s without this uh, product because we had a, some limited funding to buy physical course reserves and add it to the list for the fall. So uh, yeah, I, I also wanna add that the uh, GitHub repository is available as textbooks to pricey. And um, if you end up using it uh, for anything, <laughs> I'd be interested to hear about your experience. Um, I also have, we, because I did a demo and went pretty fast, all of that, um, I saved the session as a text file and put it in the um, reposit in the OSF project for reference. Um, that's all, and I'd also like to acknowledge uh, all of my colleagues and collaborators on this as well. I won't read through it for the sake of time, but it's there in my slides. Thank you. Hello. I'm going to go ahead and get started. So, hey, y'all. Hey, everybody. I'm Wesley Teal. I'm a metadata librarian at Iowa State University. And I'm speaking to you today from the lands of the Bokoje, Meskwaki, and Sauk. My university was built in part through the profits and lease and sale of land taken from the Ho-Chunk, Iowa, Mini, Wick, Canton, Meskwaki, Missouri, Omaha, Oto, Sauk, Sisseton, Wapikuta, Wapiton, Winnebago, and Yankton. To start out uh, my presentation, I'll address what slow librarianship is. It's an outgrowth of a broader slow movement which emerged in the 1980s with the slow foods movement. What began as a movement based around the principles that food should be good, clean, and fair evolved into a variety of related movements based generally around the ideal of, as Carl Honoré put it, to do fewer things in order to do them better. In her blog post, What is Slow Librarianship? Meredith Farkas describes it as an anti-racist, responsive, and values-driven practice that stands in opposition to neoliberal values. Slow libraries focus on relationship building, deeply understanding and meeting patron needs and, and providing equitable services to their communities. So libraries foster a culture of learning and reflection, collaboration and solidarity, valuing all kinds of contributions and supporting staff as whole people. Farkas notes that slow librarianship is a process, not a destination. It is an orientation toward our work, ourselves and others to create positive change. It's an organizational philosophy that supports workers 
and build stronger relationships with our communities. And it's a, it's a tough time to work in libraries. Burnout and low morale provide, pervade library labor. In a 2015 study, Ellen Shoup, Stephanie Wamba, and Reed Bramble found that librarians faced higher burnout rates, role ambiguity, and role overload than other career fields they sampled. A 2022 study by Barbara Wood et al. found that academic librarians are, generally speaking, in a state of burnout. On its own, burnout is unpleasant enough, but it's also linked to numerous ne negative physical, psychological, and work outcomes. Burnout increases the risk of diabetes, high cholesterol, heart disease, muscular skeletal disorders, insomnia, and depression. Burnout has been linked to dissatisfaction and increased absenteeism. Katrina Davis Kendrick has published extensively on low morale among library workers. Across public and academic libraries, workers suffer from low morale for a variety of reasons, including emotional abuse, systemic abuse, and neglect. For librarians of racial and ethnic minorities, um, the outcomes are often amplified. The negative outcomes, that is. Um, low morale can lead libraries to disengage from their librarians to disengage from their work and to seek opportunities at other libraries or to leave the field altogether. And in her recent talk, The Librarians Are Not Okay, delivered at the Conference on Academic Library Management, Anne Hillen Peterson highlights how the stresses we face go beyond just our jobs. We are in the midst of an ongoing pandemic that has killed more than 6 million people worldwide, including 1 million, more than 1 million in the US alone. We are in the midst of an ongoing reckoning with systemic racism in the US, as well as multiple climate crises, an election that was falsely treated as illegitimate by many to the point that a right-wing insurrectionists stormed the nation's capital. We are all carrying too much. We have to slow down for our own sakes and for the sakes of those we serve. So how do we slow down? One way I've been trying to address this question in my own work life is by automating away repetitive and tedious tasks. Um, as a metadata librarian, and before that, as a technical services librarian, or technical service worker, I've had many duties that involved relatively simple and repetitive tasks, like crosswalking a few metadata fields from one format to another, um, like cleaning up metadata, raw metadata, and comparing um, ISBNs and things as in the last presentation. Um, so even when uh, an individual part of a task like that may take only a minute or two to complete, scaling that work over a large number of records quickly becomes time consuming. I can crowd out time I need for more thoughtful work, like helping to plan a systems migration or helping to build local controlled vocabularies. So I've applied automation uh, to major tasks like updating 79,000 uh, print serial items records or updating permanent identifier metadata by hundreds or thousands of records in a batch. Uh, I've applied it to medium-sized projects like reconciling species names in a data set and to smaller tasks like adding a date column to a spreadsheet or tracking work statistics. And I usually use Python for all of these tasks, but sometimes PowerShell. Um, and automation is often framed as a means to increase efficiency and speed, which kind of seems at first like it's at odds with uh, the goals of like slow librarianship. But this increased efficiency can also be an inroad for slowing down. If we can turn repetitive tasks and workflows into automated processes, we can make more room for the kind of work that requires deeper attention and thought. And another way we can slow down and is in our approach to creating automated solutions. I found at its best, coding can be a contemplative process. To design effective solutions to work tasks requires a solid understanding and analysis of the problem at hand, an understanding of the desired outcomes of the project, and any possible complications or trade-offs you might have to make when, um, when you're automating um, a simple task or even a more complex one. So um, taking the time to really analyze the problem area and how you're going to solve it, um, it invites us to step back, to pause, and to make sure we approach our design with the fullest understanding possible. By taking to the time to identify the problems we are trying to solve, 
we can hopefully build solutions that are robust, reusable, and easy to adapt as the problem space evolves. My shift toward a more contemplative coding approach owes a debt to Glenn Horton uh, and his mindful coding presentation at Code for Lib Midwest 2018. Much of the workflow Horton uh, describes in his presentation fits well with a slow mindset. He advocates taking an intentional approach to planning before you begin to code, approaching coding problems with empathy empathy for your users, for yourself, and for anyone else who might have to work with your code, and making sure to take breaks in your work. The other thing that has convinced me to take a slower approach to coding is that I've had to work with plenty of code that was written in haste, often by myself, um, sometimes by others as well. And I've learned the hard way how much more difficult it is to debug or extend code that is quickly and sloppily written. So now comes the hardest part, it's actually slowing down. Uh, if you're able to minimize burdens and tasks, it may be tempting to say yes to new work instead of focusing your energy on existing work. You may even be assigned more work because you've proven you can get things done. It's important to set and maintain boundaries so that the time you work to free up isn't immediately consumed, but it can be hard. It, I'll admit it's something I have yet to really master myself, um, but fortunately I can turn to the wisdom of others like Katrina Spencer, whose comprehensive guide to resisting overcommitment provides a variety of valuable strategies for identifying overcommitment, auditing our own relationships with work, assessing our work environment and setting boundaries. And then finally, part of the way forward I think is for us who um, are more familiar with code to help shoulder the burdens of our coworkers and to let them um, help shoulder our burdens as they come up in, in our work. At its heart, slow librarianship is a communal practice, not an individual one. If you feel overworked or burnt out, so do many of your colleagues. In the short term, you can help them slow down by automating their tedious tasks so they can focus on more meaningful work. In the long term, we must organize. We need to do away with what Fabazi Attar identifies as vocational awe and transform library cultures and organizational structures into forms that are more equitable and sustainable. We need to abandon the corporate culture of overwork and exploitation that often crops up in our field and adopt practices that are in line with the library's role as a community and learning institution. We need to do less so that we can do everything better. And that's it. So I've got a few reference slides. These are also on the OSF. Um, if you wanna look into any of the folks I cited more. And I'll kind of go through these more quickly than it's really useful to, for time. So thank you very much.
Is that better for the stream? I am talking to hear if the stream can hear me. How are we doing on the stream? Excellent. I will just restart that for the benefit of the stream. So this talk is what if you did very bad things with integers or how the C Python sausage is made. This is us relaxing blissfully above the abstraction boundary that separates Python and the affordances it gives us from its C implementation. And this is the last time we will feel so serene in the course of this talk. So let us imagine we set the variable A equal to 1,000. We set the variable B equal to 1,000. And then we ask our REPL, does A equal B? Go ahead. What are we going to get? Pardon? True, I am hearing true and you are correct. We will get that A equals B. You can test this yourself in your REPL. Let us imagine we say A equals 10, B equals 10, and we ask, does A equal B? What do we expect? True, the room says true, the room is correct. Okay, what if we say A equals 1,000, B equals 1,000, and we ask our REPL, is A B? What do we expect? I'm hearing a lot of false, and you are correct. This is false. That's kind of weird. Why, why is this happening? Um, I'll get to that in just a moment. Let's say we say A equals 10, B equals 10. We ask our REPL, is A B? What do we expect? I'm hearing false, and the answer is true. What? OK, so what is happening here? is under the surface when you declare a variable, Python has to allocate some memory to put that variable in. And when you ask Python, is something equal to something, it will say, does this thing have like an equality function? I will use this equality function to compare those values. Uh, if A is 1,000 and B is 1,000, those have the same values. That's great, they're equal. But when you use the is operator, Python asks, did you put those in the same location in memory? Like, are they the same object in memory under the surface? And in general, if you declare two variables, they are not the same object in memory. Python will allocate them as you declare them. However, this bit of C that you don't actually have to be able to read, and I couldn't read, even if I were looking at it on GitHub, because it's C, what do I know about it? Um, actually defines a segment from a, a, a small positive integer, 257, down to a small negative integer, negative five. And it pre-allocates every single one of these in memory when you start up Python. It figures you're probably gonna need to use them fairly often. And so every single one of these, there's a little linked list, there's a bit of metadata about the object, and then there's the actual value. So what if, however, we said, well, these are just, things in memory, we can change what's in memory. But if we were evil and just made one of those values different, Python went to look for 254 and found something else there. Well, we can do this. There's this module called C types that lets you kind of reach through Python to its C implementation. It gives you some Python wrappers for those C functions. And you can define a function that will find the location in memory of, say, your integer. Did I type check that these were integers? No, I have no idea what you're redefining here. Have fun. You do you, YOLO. Um, <laughs> but you could take something that you hope is an integer and, and find its value in memory and something else it's a different integer and just take the value of one and stick it into the other. And then you could say, well, let's mutate in. Let's change seven into 10. And what happens? Well, as you would expect for I in range zero to 10 print, I, you get zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, 10, eight, nine. Great. Math works too. Seven plus one, now 11. Rock on with your bad self. So let's ask, what is truth? What is truth? Because you may know that in Python, actually true is, is one. If you ask, what is the, uh, is instance true of an integer? It is true. True is the same as the integer one in some sense. So could we, could we redefine true? I don't know. Let's try it. Uh, what happens if you mutate in and you say, well, let's just change one to 
five. I don't know, something else and see what happens. And then you type one in your REPL and the world explodes. Um, your interpreter just checks out at this point. That said, if you write that same code in a file and you run it from the command line, Python, you know, weird integers.py, it will run. You can do this. Uh, please don't try accessing things in memory outside of these predefined integers because I really can't guarantee what you're going to do to your computer if you do that. This is a terrible idea, to be clear. Uh, you should try it anyway because it's really fun, but just with integers. So I will upload this to OSF and you will see my bizarre cryptic incantations and you can find out what happens when you do very bad things to integers. Thank you. Uh, we will be at our next lightning talk as soon as I find the tab that I just suddenly lost. Where did you go? Oh, there it is. So our next lightning talk will be patron. I'm going to say patron driven development by Mike. Well, it actually reads patron drive development. So you're going to be talking about uh, teaching uh, patrons how to drive, correct? Yeah, libraries are multi-service. So, you know, we've been replacing all the other civil services, you know. <laughs> the worst part is medical uh, libraries are now having to do like uh, appendectomies. Oh boy, Adobe has decided to install some updates at a perfect time. <laughs> Thank you, Adobe. Sorry for the delay on this. Adobe is updating, and so we're going to have to grab the slides from uh, Google Slides. Thank you. Um, so this is, um, I just want to preface this with this is an idea that I've been kicking around for a little while after someone at my uh, work came up with said something similar and I kind of came up with this idea. So this is just something that I want to put out there and I would love to have feedback, you know, thoughts, anything about that. And it is patron driven development. Is this an idea? Is this something? Is this nothing? <laughs> um, so right now um, I work in a very kind of tech you know, tech driven envi work environment. And so what drives our development? There's a couple of three different kind of modes that I've heard talked about, and we've had presentations on these. The one that we kind of do is test driven development, if we do this at all. So um, does our product 
um, we have requirements and we write tests, unit tests, integration tests around that. So that kind of feels like we write the test ourselves as engineers, as a department, and then we test our software to see if it fulfills those, those tests. And that's great, you know, it encourages us to iterate, you know, it gives us an idea of what we're working towards and it, you know, gives us a target to hit, but these are written by us. Um, that's kind of what behavior-driven development is trying to uh, address, which this relies on user stories, right? User stories are a thing that I think a lot of people here are familiar with. We kind of, people have used those for a long time to kind of brainstorm ideas. Um, but these uses them to build a shared understanding of between engineers, product owners, you know, quality assurance people, blah, blah, blah. Um, and capture the requirements of an application. So we're less testing towards specific functionality and more like, does this application, this piece of software, the whatever, work the way that we think it should? Um, and that gives you kind of a more holistic way of evaluating the thing that you're building, that you're working on. Um, but that still is coming from within the department, from engineers, from other people who are working on this all the time. And then there's a hybrid approach, which is acceptance test-driven development, um, which takes kind of that more holistic approach that BDD has, um, um, but still has like a specific test that gets run. So you would have like an integration test that tests your application. If I click on this button, I, you know, get a hold request, you know, in my catalog or something like that. Um, and it tries to capture what the functionality should be. But the thing about all of these things, right, is that, you know, and that acceptance test right there is we are still writing the tests. We are still implementing what the requirements for the software that we're writing is. And so what's missing from this? And what's missing is patrons. So all of these approaches either omit the patron entirely, right? Test-driven development, like we're writing, I'm writing tests for my software. Um, or remediating, like maybe we're getting patron feedback from there's a bug here, this doesn't work the way that I thought, but they're not directly participating in that kind of development process. Um, so we can try and get that, um, that input from various ways, whether that's like interviewing them or doing stuff like that. But in the reality, like they're on the outside looking in and we build software inside. And that, and like, so generally, like by the time we're talking to a patron, we've already decided what we want to build. Like we want to build a web page that does something. We want to add this functionality. Like um, they're coming in in a very contained kind of isolated um, perspective. And so what this results in what I call engineer brain, right? Like you, in a way, we can't get away from this. We work with these systems. We understand them in depth, whether because we originated them or have been working with them for a really long time. And it's really hard to see outside of that. Even when you think you're seeing outside of that, your perspective is still of an engineer, a, a power user, someone who, um, and we're not building these systems for ourselves. We're building them for a lot of different people. And we can't make that assumption about what we're doing. And so in libraries, I don't need to really explain this, I don't, I, I don't think, which is we have the idea of patron-driven acquisition. Um, so this happens, you know, we get a bunch of requests for an ebook, you know, we look at those and we say, this ebook's being requested a lot, we should acquire licenses. And the idea is that we allocate resources where our patrons are going naturally. So if they want a book, they want an audio book, you know, some kind of resource, you know, we're going to acquire for them based off, off that input. Um, there's also, you know, more indirect ways of doing it, but the kind of like, you know, acquisition, we are acquiring materials for what um, patrons want. And so this is the idea, which is patron driven development. Um, this came out of a context of building, like, you know, improving how we can do, e, you know, e-lending and, and building out our platform for that um, is how can we improve how, you know, if we're doing, you know, traditional librarianship that's being driven by patrons, how can we do more development of the software that's, that does, that serves those, you know, resources to them? And how can we build features that have been asked for by patrons? So instead of trying to guess what a patron might want, we go out and ask them, you know, and that's hard, right? We don't, you can't really go out and ask one person, you know, what 
uh, because a person can say, well, I want that book, and you can go give it to them. But if you build an interface for one person, like 100,000 other people are going to use that interface. Um, so the question, so, which is, the, like, I, I, so there's the question that I'm kind of ending on, which is, um, how do we solicit that? How do we, you know, that feels like there's an opportunity there to go out to people and say, let's not, let's not waste our time. Let's not waste your time. Let's build exactly what you want. And so that you can access the material, the materials you want and the way that you want. And, um, and we avoid spending a lot of time building on something that maybe we thought some thought a bunch of people would have used. And then you find out six months, a year down the road that no one's used it. Um, and that allows us to have a much bigger impact on our, our patron and the communities that we serve. Um, and of course, and the hard challenge between this is, is balancing the expertise that we have as, as, as library professionals and information professionals and um, meeting the service of people. So that's, that's the question. How can we, I, I, think that there's, I think there's an idea here of taking patrons and, and, and the expertise that we bring, they bring and the expertise that we bring and, and merging that into a kind of a new model that's not just being driven by like a very narrow set of requirements that a small number of people are choosing and turning that into something that's being driven much more by the community. Um, and that's, like I said, if anybody has any thoughts, I would love to talk about this. This is an idea I've been kicking around for a long time and, and be really curious to hear other people's perspectives on it. So thank you. And next up is Matt with Data Access Networks. Oh, good. We had a Matt volunteer because if we didn't know, we would just find anyone named Matt and make you give the talk. All right. Hi, everybody. Am I coming through okay on the stream? Yeah, great. Um, well, hi, I'm Matt Hutchinson. I work at the uh, Business School Library at Stanford. And um, this is my first time at Code for Lib, so I felt peer pressured to contribute um, something today. <laughs> um, so it kind of gave away the, the reveal here. I was going to bring this up. Um, but we've been looking at ways to organize our metadata um, around our data sets. So the Stanford Business School is trying to move away from the sort of traditional business education, which was focused on case studies and more sort of uh, narrative descriptions of, of business problems and, and business practices, and move into more of a data analytics and a data-driven sort of educational framework, which means as a library, we're requiring many more data sets and we have to sort of build capacity to you know, we're expecting to have even more in the future. So we're trying to plan ahead and come up with a good way to, to manage that and keep track of it. Now, I'm sure you know, any of us in this room could stand up and talk about how we manage metadata and all the challenges and all the different solutions and ideas we've had. So I'm not going to get into that today. That's probably a much bigger conversation. Um, but what I wanted to show you a uh, couple of images here today um, was from a simple shiny app I put together, which kind of pitched to our library leadership some ideas about um, you know, once we have all this data, once we have it all organized, and it's all, you know, we reach that beautiful state of having perfectly, you know, accurate metadata for everything. And we're able to track all of our user activity and all of our licensing requirements and everything else. What do we want to do with it at that point? Now, obviously there's, you know, the traditional uses, we want to use it for discovery and for education and for budgeting and things like that. But can we also do some analytics and learn more about our collections based on um, the data we've been able to collect? And can we look at it in a, you know, what are the different ways we can understand and analyze our data? Um, so I say this was, um, you know, just put together um, with a handful of, of data sets. It's just kind of an example. It's an illustration rather than an actual working platform. Um, and we're just about to sort of dive into the project. I was able to convince the staff at the library, at least at, at the GSB, this was a good idea. But let me know if you think it's a good idea as well, because I'm about to start work on it. <laughs> so. 
as I just found out at lunchtime about fail for lib in the pre-conference. So maybe in a couple of years, I'll be back <laughs> with the same idea. We'll see how it goes. Um, so what we're looking at here, and I don't know how well you can see it in the, in, in the room, but um, I didn't want to get in too close because I've got some user, you know, user names and things just for, for privacy, but I can show you in more detail if you'd like to come and talk to me afterwards. Um, the green nodes you can see in the network here are, are data sets, which are owned or licensed or controlled by the library. And the blue nodes are, are researchers. And so the edges connecting them represent that that user has signed an agreement to access or to use with that data. So, you know, a, a data access agreement saying, I will not copy or steal this data. And, and they've been granted access to the data. And then you'll see the green nodes are sized based on the, if you see up in the top left, sorry, people watching who can't see me pointing. <laughs> um, in the top left, we have the page rank algorithm in a drop down there. So, I mean, with a bipartite network like this, where we have two classes of nodes, page rank is, you know, obviously more analogous to uh, centrality or something, but you can see the, in general, the larger the node, the uh, more important, which is obviously a relative measure, the more important the node is in the network. Um, <clears throat> now there's a lot of different ways to measure importance and what exactly that means. This is just one example. Um, but the idea is rather than just saying, well, we know this data set has 10 users, this data set has 20 users, we can start to come up with you know, different measures of the significance of these data sets in our collection. And we can start to identify communities within the data as well. So for example, and again, sorry for those watching remotely, down at the bottom here, at the very bottom of the slide, we see a sort of closely connected cluster. And here we have a group of data sets all from the same vendor. And it looks like, at least based on this you know, sample data, the people who want access to one of those data sets want access to all the data sets. You know, from that vendor, for example. Or we see over here on the far right, there's a little isolated community where we've just got one team working by themselves who aren't connected to the rest of the research community, or at least aren't using any other data sets that the rest of the community are using. And then we can also see kind of, I mean, I can't, I don't know if I can point out, I can't really jump up high enough to point to it, but there's a couple of users who are sort of bridge communities who are the one person using data sets which are, you know, arcing across uh, different different sectors. Um, so not only is this a different way for us to evaluate the value of our data sets, but what I would really like to do in a, again, in the perfect world scenario would be to link then these researchers out to their research they're producing with this data. And then we can start looking at trends and saying, well, does our, the high impact research coming out of our business school, is it using, you know, is it from the users who are all really focused on one community of data sets? Or does high impact research come from users who you know, bridge across multiple data sets and who are making those connections and those kind of unique uh, insights. Uh, and I'll just scroll down and show you the other one. So looking at the same network again, in a static form now, this is even less, or well, even harder to see, I should say, than the previous one. This is the same network again, with the nodes all equally sized, but now we're applying the, again, up in the top left, the Louvain clustering algorithm. Now, if you've ever done any network science, there are as many clustering algorithms as there are network scientists. That, I think that's how you get your PhD in network science is by creating your own clustering algorithm. So this is just one example. And obviously this is where you get into sort of the art of data science rather than the science part, because <laughs> there's a whole bunch of different ways to do it. Um, but so we can, you know, using an arbitrarily picked clustering algorithm in this case, we can start identifying uh, statistically measurable communities within our community, <laughs> within our ecosystem of users and data sets. And so we can start pairing them up. So we see we have three data sets in this one, and we have another three here. Uh, and obviously, you know, we can argue back and forth about which clusters, you know, which should be in which cluster and how we want to calculate clusters. Um, oh, I should say, I guess if you haven't done any clustering before, in general, what it does is it it's looking at the actual distribution of edges of connections in the network versus a randomly generated um, set of edges and seeing, well, are there any measure, you know, statistically measurable differences? But obviously there's a whole bunch of variation and you know, different ways to do it. Um, but yeah, so the idea is we can hopefully, with a, an approach similar to this, go beyond the simple sort of people who use this data set also use this data set, but instead ident start identifying so sort of communities of practice within our um, research uh, community. And then hopefully, uh, pot or potentially, we can use this to make recommendations. It could be another way 
theoretically to service sort of discoverability for users. If we can create sort of individual user profiles or we know what users are interested in, then we can say, well, maybe you'd be interested also in some of you know, the other data sets in that community. But of course, I mean, the risk is then it becomes a self-fulfilling you know, prophecy, right? And you recommend people use this one and then they end up just using the same one that they're recommended. But at least in this way, we have some sort of measure of distance, right? So if people are just sticking into one community, we can say, well, this is you know, what most people like you are interested in, but here's the data set you know, up at the very top in that isolated uh, little bubble there. Here's the data set most distant from what you're interested in. Maybe you'd want to check out something further from your you know, everyday data sets that you're used to using. And uh, I think a real, another really interesting feature, which or another potential feature, would be to look at this over time and to see how these communities change and how people move, you know, how data sets sort of move from community to community and how does our uh, community at the library uh, change their behavior. So, you know, are people sort of clustering one year around one data set and then the next year that data set is out of fashion and everybody's moved on to something else? Or do we see distinct, you know, separate communities starting to emerge with, I don't know, finance people are working on this set of data sets and marketing people are working on this other set? And then do we have, you know, do, would we have a, a greater impact if we were able to create sort of bridging events and bring these you know, separate communities together and stop people sort of self-sorting into um, building those interdisciplinary sort of communications as we identify them. So that's the idea. Um, so if you have tried anything like this uh, and you think oh, this is never gonna work, come let me know because <laughs> next week when I get back, this is what I'm going to be doing. <laughs> um, but if you like it and or would like to you know, see more detail and more information, come and find me and I can show you some more um, detailed illustrations. And if you, if you really, really like it, uh, we're also hiring a developer. So if anyone wants to come and live in Palo Alto, it's nice and sunny, <laughs> and then come find me afterwards. But uh, yes, yeah, so that's my idea. Thanks so much. So let's thank our very brave first day lightning talk, uh, you know, you know, speakers, because, you know, see, we don't bite. So we are on break now until 415. But while you're out there having a break, look at that breakout poster. All that you have to do for a breakout is propose a topic and show up in a room and then let the conversation flow. And if you lightning talk, you know, we encourage people to do these. And sometimes at the reception, some people momentarily disappear and they'll find themselves, you know, out saying like, yes, I'll give a lightning talk tomorrow. That doesn't really happen. We don't disappear, people. I have a very twisted sense of humor. But please give a consideration. We have lightning talks tomorrow and also on Thursday. And even if you're not ready for breakouts tomorrow, we will also have a breakout session on Thursday. So please do it. Like I said, 415. Enjoy your break. <clears throat> check, check. So, what we were doing. The mic.
That's why the message popped up. It's, it's, yeah, I know. But if this thing is switching off, one, two, one, two, one, two, check.
Tina shut down and have him come in. Shut down? The, 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 um, oh, the slide. Yeah, oh, the sponsor. Um, we could go it. We've got a couple minutes. Okay. Yeah, let's build in some gaps. Hey, hey, hey. <clears throat> One, two, one, two, one, two, check. Hello, can oh, you hear me in there? Yes, loud and clear. Thank you, Chris. Excellent, excellent. Okay, last session of the day. We've almost made it through. And I believe we most people have made it. So, you know. So we're gonna be starting with a 15-minute talk by uh Chulin Meng, Christopher Creswell, Michelle Cernofsky on small team taking on large library technology project. Some reflection on the quest for open source library management platform at Lehigh. And we will pass it over now to Christopher. Okay, let me share my screen and make sure I get the correct one. Go. All right, are you seeing the slides? Sorry, I shouldn't have uh, waited for you to walk away from the mic before I asked that. <laughs> yes, we can see the slides. See the slides. Excellent, very good. Then I am going to proceed. So, hi everyone. I'm Chris Creswell from Lehigh University. Um, my co presenters are Chulin Meng and Michelle Sarnowski. I'll be the only one speaking on the Zoom, but we're all available in the uh, conference Slack, and our contact information is in the slides. So, if anyone wants to reach out and ask us questions, we're more than happy to talk about it. Um, so, I'm going to tell a story about how at Lehigh we implemented open source library management systems with a small library technology team. Um, over the past, we've done it twice in the past 10 years or so. So there's a perception within the library world that you can't use open source systems unless you have a large dedicated technical staff within your library. And uh, so we'd like to tell our story about how we've done it with a small library technology team twice in the past 10 years, and also talk a little bit about how you can participate with open source systems, even if you don't have any dedicated technical staff in your library. And there's a quote from Marshall Breeding about this. So a few words about who we are. We are Lehigh University. Uh, we are located in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, uh, about an hour's drive north of Philadelphia near Allentown. We're a medium-sized institution, about 5,000 undergraduates, 1,800 grad students, 540 faculty and five colleges. And we have a small library technology team. It was three people at the time that we implemented all the efforts that I'm talking about today. It's three people today, though there have been some changes. All of us who were part of the team at the time that we uh, implemented the efforts I'm talking about today are here. Um, and Lehigh has a merged organization of library and technology services, so the librarians and the technical staff do work pretty closely together. 
So a few words about what exactly it is that we did. In 2010, Lehigh joined the Kuali Open Library Environment Project to design the next generation library system. We worked on that for a few years and then migrated to Kuali Olay in 2014 from our legacy Circe Dynex ILS. And then we started participating in the Folio collaboration in 2016. And we had so much fun implementing Olay the first time around that we decided to be among the first round of implementers for Folio also in 2020. And we use several other open source applications within the library at Lehigh. We use Viewfind as our discovery layer. Oh, my uh, video just went away. I'm going to proceed as if you can still hear me, even though my video disappeared. Oh, there it is. Um, we use Viewfind as our uh, discovery system, our library catalog. We use Islandora for our uh, digital repository, and we use Archive Space uh, as uh, for records and finding aids for our, mostly our special collections system. Oh, good. I, I'm told that you can still hear me and see me. <laughs> My video came back. Okay. Um, oh, there it goes again. Come on, monitor. There we go. So as for how it worked out, it worked out pretty, pretty good. Um, I don't actually watch Curb Your Enthusiasm, so I don't know if Larry David means this uh, sincerely or uh, sarcastically, And uh, <laughs> but I mean it very sincerely. I just wanted a nice eye-catching gif. So uh, a, a few more words about how it worked out. Uh, we ran Olay for about seven years with no external support beyond HTC Global Services that did the development work and provided critical bug fixes. Um, we There was only one really bad day when we were running it that required restoring from a database backup and then running some manual database queries to delete some rows that were causing the application to repeatedly go into a death spiral on restart. Um, but it was relatively smooth sailing for seven years. Other than that, we provided all levels of support with our small team. Um, you know, We answered the phones and support emails as, as needed and uh, analyze log files and reconfigured things as needed. And it was relatively smooth sailing. When we were implementing Folio, we ran a local instance during our migration and testing phases. And uh, it worked pretty well and was instrumental in getting our data migrated because it gave us direct access to the data at the time. Anyway, Folio did not have um, performance anyway, uh, batch ingest APIs. Uh, now I understand that, that it does, but at the time it didn't have that at all. So you would have to load your records one at a time, which is not really tenable um, for this kind of thing. So um, my monitor keeps flicking off. That's very helpful, come on. Um, after we went live with Folio, uh, we let go of this. Uh, Index Data now hosts a test instance for us in addition to our production instance. And Index Data's hosting service has been very good overall. Uh, we're still very active in the community at all levels, our library technology team, our librarian subject matter experts, and our administration. So why is it important for libraries to participate in open source communities? It's good for the library community. It results in better software for everyone. Um, it's good for library staff development. They'll learn new skills and connect with people at other institutions and within the project. And it's good for innovation in general. Everyone will have uh, a better experience if we all contribute our ideas. So. Open source systems require participation. They kind of live and die based on participation. Otherwise, they don't stay open. It's a lot like democracy. If we don't have enough participation from people, someone else will make all the decisions and you won't like them. So what does it take to actually run it yourself on premises? Well, if you are going to run it yourself on premises, you are going to need a dedicated, skilled technical staff. Uh, you'll need a sysops person to administer the servers and supporting services. Um, you'll need a uh, developer staff to write migration and integration code. Come on, my monitor keeps cutting out. Um, both of those people will be spending about 50% of their time exclusively dedicated to this project during the migration and, and uh, implementation phase. That eases up a lot after migration. The developer probably should be embedded in the library staff so that they can um, you know, be intimately familiar with the librarian's needs. The sysops person doesn't necessarily have to be, but it helps. You need management and administration buy-in to uh, defend the time of these people and defend the project as a priority against all other competing priorities, because it is a large undertaking. Come on, monitor. Um, you need subject matter experts willing to spend extra time st testing your local implementation, because uh, there will be decisions that your technical staff will have made in configuring this thing that are not the same as hosting companies will have made and uh, other institutions. So you need people to uh, to uh, test it more that way. And my monitor has gone into power save mode, so I can't see anything. Come on. Hang on a sec, everyone. I need to try taking my laptop out of its docking station so that I just have its own display.
All right, I'm going to need someone in Slack to tell me if you can still hear me and see me because my display has gone crazy. Can anyone see and hear me over there? Somebody chime in with a microphone or in Slack. All right. Can someone tell me if you can see or hear me now? Can hear but not see. Zoom settings. Video. All right, apologies for the uh, <laughs> technical difficulties. Those were not anything with the conference. That was my own laptop being super weird on me. I'm just going to uh, proceed from where I was. So we were talking about what it takes to run it yourself. Um, and I think I had gotten through most of this. Yes, I was talking about um, subject matter experts willing to spend time testing uh, your local implementation. Um, so you will need your librarians to spend a little more time um, working on testing a local implementation because your technical people will have made some decisions that are probably different um, than uh, other other institutions may have. And I have five minutes because of <laughs> my lost time. I'm going to move it along. So how we did it with LA, we bought our own hardware. We asked our central IT to recommend us something. They recommended an IBM X3550 M4, wrapped it in our data center and set up the networking. And then we did the rest. I installed the OS from a USB drive and moved on from there with Folio. We used virtual machines in our VMware cluster. Our uh, virtual hardware and networking setup was set up by Central IT. Then they gave me an account in vSphere and I installed the OS and moved from there. We had lots of interaction with staff at other institutions collaborating on setup, lots of trial and error and configuration. Documentation helps, but we'll never quite cover everything. Please contribute back what you learn. Um, we wrote lots of custom scripts to migrate and clean up our data. Please share that stuff on GitHub. Um, and this is why it'll take a year or two to get implemented because you have to iterate on all these steps several times. That's all I'm going to say here, but we're happy to talk about this in the conference Slack or via email. So when we implement, implemented Folio, we took a slightly different approach. Um, Folio has a, a strong community with many more institutions of varying sizes participating and using it. Um, it has better vendor participation. There's lots of hosting and migration services available and lots of developer teams contributed by various sources. And uh, so that gives everyone flexible implementation options. Most institutions are using vendor hosting right now, but not everyone. We ran it ourselves for a while, and I know at least Texas A&M is running it themselves as well. Uh, so how can you participate in Folio if you don't have technical staff? You can still help shape how Folio works. 
You should join special interest groups, committees, mailing lists, Slack workspaces. We'll have some links at the end of the slides that you can uh, use to, to find all these things. And then when you're in there, be vocal about your institution's, institution's needs and workflows. Um, every time there's a new major release coming out, there's a bug fest where everyone can participate. And uh, that's a good way to get your foot in the door, learn about the system and uh, you know become known in the community and get involved in project governance. It might seem a little boring and tedious, but it's important. And that's where some of those decisions I mentioned are made. And if you're not a part of it, then uh, someone else will make all the decisions. So uh, here are some examples about how non-technical staff in the Lehigh libraries uh, are participating in the Folio community. Sharon Wiles Young is our Director of Library Access Services. She's on the Folio Product Council. Mark Canny is our Manager of Library Lending Services, and he's part of the Folio Resource Access Special Interest Group. Lisa McCall is our Metadata Services Manager, and she's on the Metadata Management Special Interest Group. And Chulin Meng, our Library Director of Library Technology, is part of the Folio Technical Council. So if you are implementing Folio without a technical staff, you are going to probably want to use a commercially hosted Folio. And so a few words about how long it will take you to implement that way. If you're a large library, nine months to a year. For a, for a medium to small library, six to nine months. Most of this time will be spent on decisions and conversations with your vendor about your data. Uh, you'll be loading your data a bunch of different times with them, um, trying to figure out all the details. And this is a good opportunity to go through your workflows to simplify things. You'll be cleaning up your data anyway, so you can figure out what about your current workflows are dictated by your existing system and which things you like and what you want to keep and what you don't. Um, you can simplify your CERC policies as well. Um, so here are some links to uh, Folio documentation. Uh, there was the wiki there where you can find installation and configuration documentation, the link where you can join the Folio Slack workspace, the project website where you can find information about the project itself. I rushed a bit through some of that because I was worried I was running out of time after my technical difficulties. Here's our contact information. If you'd like to reach out to any of us for more, uh, more details about any of this, and we're in the conference Slack. So that's all I had to say. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to leave this up for a moment, and actually my time is about up, so I'm going to stop the share. <laughs> I'm going to leave the Zoom, but I'll be available in the uh, conference Slack and watching the YouTube live stream in a minute.
Hello, we're testing sound. You guys in the room can still hear me, right? Excellent. Did they say I can hear it too? Yeah. All right, great, thank you. Excellent. Okay, now everything is gonna go perfectly now. Oh, come on. <laughs> One more time. <laughs> okay, it's going to happen this time. Thank you for your patience. I was going to just thank you for your patience and being kind of attended at the end of the day, but the technical things added a little extra. So thank you, extra. I'm going to talk about some work we're doing at Lyricist and in the community to sustain open source programs. Okay, um, so I'll talk a little about It Takes a Village. Um, Lyricist is a membership organization and we're active in the community. And one of the things we were hearing a lot about was institutions that were our members and in the community saying, you know, we love open source, we wanna support open source, but you know, we're a little concerned about sustainability. So we thought, what could we do to help? We approached IMLS and they've been very generous in supporting some work that we're doing. Um, the whole idea was to bring together different open source programs serving cultural heritage to develop shared sustainability strategies and provide info needed to assess and contribute to sustainability. So the first phase was a form and guidebook in 2017 to 19, and then more recently a practical toolkit. So I'll talk about both of those. I always like to give credit to all the excellent folks that are involved. Um, I'm the co-director along with my colleague, who's amazing, Megan Forbes, who's also the collection manager collection space program manager, and we have an amazing advisory group. Rob Cardellano from Columbia, Tom Kramer from Stanford, Michelle Kimpton, who used to be at DPLA and is now at Lyricist, Catherine Skinner from Educopia, and Ann Baird Whiteside from Harvard. And if you're good, you can see those people in the picture. I, I should make a game like a Where's Waldo. You can see each one if you look really hard. Each time I look, I find another one. And that picture was taken at our Baltimore Forum in 2017. I also like to thank all the people that were participating in 2017 in that Baltimore forum. We had over 30 different programs represented and I asked our nice graphics designer, can you make me a nice slide with all the programs? And he said, nope, because there are too many, so they have to go into. So we appreciate all their efforts and the lessons learned that they shared. So before the forum in Baltimore, we did a survey. Okay, we're gonna continue to test the sound. Should we get something now? 
in Slack, if you can let us know if you can hear me. Excellent, excellent, sorry, excellent. You can still hear me in the room, I'm assuming. Yes, thank you for your patience. Um, I don't know when we lost you, so we're just gonna keep going. Um, Okay, excellent. Um, okay, so the thing that we kind of realized in the survey and when we were coming together is there's not a recipe for sustainability. It's not do X, Y, Z and Xanadu, you're sustainable. It's not a one thing, it's not a straight line, it's cyclical. And so there's phases and facets that move together and separately. So this is uh, the facets we wanted. To, when people think about sustainability, in this setting, they tend to think about money. Money's important, but it's not the only thing. So we broke it up into four different facets, governance, technology, resources, and community engagement. Governance is really establishing rules and processes, figuring out who makes decision, who decides to go live, who decides the security issue is overwhelming, who decides who pays what. Technology is all the software development and challenges that impact the development process in an open source context. Resources are both money, but also people and money to pay people. And my personal favorite, community engagement. This is the efforts to foster involvement within a community. It's really turning people that are using in the, the software into stakeholders that care about the software. There we go. And the phases, there are three of them. Getting started, this is the early phase of planning, design, and development. Maybe you're in a grant, maybe you're still in development, maybe you have a beta. Phase two is the typically the longest. This is where you're growing. This is the, okay, I'm gonna move along faster. Do I really have, oh, I'm just gonna whine that technical issues took up some of my time, but I will move along. Uh, phase two is where you could die on the beach. So you really need to move things along. And phase three is assessing and evolving. This is where you're thinking, this is working, excellent. And this is where you need to be aware of complacency because you need to go back around. Your pro those community needs are gonna to continue to evolve. And so you're probably gonna to need to evolve into phase one again. Why does it wanna go that way? So you put these together. This is a sustainability wheel of phases and facets. And hopefully you can see that you might be at phase one with governance, phase two with technology, phase three with resources although that would be a very weird combination, but it helps you to think in terms of each facet having its own phase and community is at the heart of it. It resulted in a guidebook in 2019. Um, I would say more, but that's, you could download it right now. People really were receptive and said great things, but they said, this is super helpful. How do I do it? So we, I know how to use a mouse, I swear. I don't know why it keeps going the wrong way. So we went back to it, um, IMLS and they very kindly gave us some additional funding to do the next step, to make a toolkit that made practical elements so that you could implement the toolkit. So the first year, which was COVID, which is super fun, we decided we would take the objectives the moving forward objectives and make activities. So for example, if you're in phase one of governance and you wanna to get to phase two, your moving forward objectives are defining a need for governance, reviewing existing governance models, selecting the governance models that work well. And they said, those are great. How do I define a need for governance? So what we did is convened some excellent people that gave us excellent feedback um, and actually talked through what would be involved in an activity that would help you define a need for governance. So for example, catastrophizing. This is where you brainstorm a list of catastrophes that would have a significant impact on your program's ability to fulfill a mission. So your program manager wins the lottery, moves to Guam. Uh, your software has some huge infrastructure issue. They gave us super helpful feedback. This is a nice iteration chart where we kept iterating. Right now, we're at piloting phase. We've done the workshops, we've done the tools. We love feedback. And so if you go to lyricist.org slash ITAV, you can see them in process. We love feedback. Please sign up for the listserv and give us feedback. If you like it, if you don't, help. feedback is helpful. Thank you.
I do try to give more time when there are technical issues, but I will also say that working report on sustainability, I've read it and it is quite good. I was reviewing it as part of my job at Syracuse University Library, so thank you. Up next is Heather Greer Klein, confident and ready, developing a code of conduct incident response plan. You do not have to be confident and ready for the technology though. You can panic if you feel like it. Oh, hi, everyone. My name is Heather Greer Klein. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the Sanvera Community Manager. All right. Today, I'm going to share how the Sanvera community developed a manual and process for volunteers who respond to reports of a code of conduct violation. The manual was created with a Creative Commons license, so you're welcome to adapt it for any community that you're a part of. I'll also share how we balance being a welcoming community space with protecting ourselves against outside disruption. So a quick content note, I'm going to mention the existence of and a few strategies used by harassers targeting individuals with marginalized identities. I will not be describing any content of any messages. All right, so first I'm gonna briefly tell you about our community and the iterations we've had in the past few years when it comes to community safety. So the Sanvera community creates and uses a suite of open source repository technologies. We started in 2008, we had three founding partners. We now have 33 partners, um, over hundred adopters around the world. Our Slack workspace, which is our primary community channel has over a thousand members. We have active working groups and we have events with over 200 attendees. Um, and we've also, we've had an anti-harassment policy since our first in-person conference in 2014, and it was last revised and updated in 2019. But beginning in 2020, the Samvera Code of Conduct Working Group recognized that we had a problem our community volunteers felt underprepared to address code of conduct violations or other community safety concerns if and when they were to arise. It wasn't clear who had what role if a report was being made and who made decisions when we needed to have a response. So the group worked with two consultants to develop materials to address these concerns. We first worked with diversity and inclusion consultant Sage Sharp from OtterTech for a code of conduct response workshop for the working group members. And after that training experience, the group wanted to create a detailed response plan. So we worked with community safety consultant, Annalie Flower Horn. All right, so I'll share some highlights of the, how that manual ensures we have prepared and confident volunteer team. So the first section of the manual deals with documentation and policies that ensure that all community participants are aware of the code of conduct and expectations for community participation. And the section lays out the work that I do as community manager. Uh, we vet all of our volunteers who are going to be tasked with responding to these reports. And that's who we call the response team. And we have detailed requirements for onboarding and for third party training. So individuals on the response team have two primary goals when responding to a reported code of conduct violation. 
And coming to understand these goals was probably the most important part of this entire process for us. So our goals are to prevent future harm to the community and to mitigate to the extent possible harm the incident has already caused or is causing. So when handling difficult incidents, it can be easy to get distracted by other objectives such as punishing an offender or defending the community's actions. And these distractions can lead to a response process and an outcome that doesn't serve our primary goals. And the team may also feel internal or external pressure to try to prioritize the mental health of people they're sanctioning or to seek a form of justice or to facilitate a reconciliation process. And these goals are beyond the code of conduct response team's capacity and training. So our manual details the process that happens when a report is made. Response team members are assembled. They form an incident team for a specific report. They recuse rec rec themselves if needed. For example, if there's an employment or close personal relationship with involved parties. Um, our manual has a checklist. It has a lot of forms uh, for speaking with involved parties and for looking back at records for any previous incidents. So once the incident has been investigated and the response team is confident, they've gathered as much information as they can, they meet to determine how to respond. And we have a range of response options that we provide ahead of time as part of our anti-harassment policy. But our working group had a lot of questions specifically about reporting decisions to the community. So that's well described in our manual. There's details about how to share information with involved parties and how to do a um, wider community public incident report. It's an anonymized fact-based description of what occurred and what actions the response team took to address the incident. So these reinforce community norms and have a level of accountability for the response team. So while we were in the midst of this work, I was alerted to a different sort of community safety threat, one that came from outside of our community.
Testing one, two, three. Video signal is back. Audio is back. Testing one, two, three. Can everybody hear me? In you on YouTube. Okay, YouTube's okay. Video's gone. Sharing is fine. The videos. Audio is fine. Sharing is fine. The videos out. Um, the slide will be shared, but um, not the video. No worries. We have two minutes. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, back to our scary times. Uh, so we were in the midst of this work when this happened, the working group realized quickly that the work we'd been doing um, around the manual and the response team, it really didn't apply in this situation. We were, this situation fell squarely within the responsibilities of myself as the community manager. So I set about ensuring that our community channels would remain welcoming and easy to access, but also would be hardened with moderation in place to prevent access by anyone whose only goal might be community disruption. So for example, as we first became aware of this issue, I was told that a harasser had bragged about creating false accounts on Sanvera's Slack and stated an intention of spreading inflammatory information there. In response to this, I combed through two years of Slack user creation information, looked at email addresses, profile information, and community participation since joining. And sure enough, I uncovered a cache of Gmail addresses that were pretty obviously preparing for a coordinated harassment attack. So I was relieved we were able to prevent this because, um, and, and as a result, I audited all of our community channels. I made sure there was always some moderation in place for new users. This is easy to do in Google groups. Um, we also now have an extra layer of security. If you have a non-institutional email address, you have to have a friendly conversation with me via email about your interest in our community before I'll let you into our Slack space. And so far, so good. So for the next steps, um, we're really excited. All of our team is vetted, they're trained, they feel confident, they feel ready. We have regular reviews and procedures scheduled and we're looking forward to our first in-person event. Um, even though we're, you know, you always hope you don't have a report, but if a report happens, we're ready for it. So that bit.ly link will take you to the Simvera incident response plan and more information. And thank you very much. We're going to do a quick transition to our last talk, which is. Karen uh, Majewitz, uh, how we keep a small open source community afloat, reflections on Geo Blacklight. And we'll have some announcements after this talk.
And Heather, as a person who outed herself as a trans woman in her talk, thank you for what you did. Really, thank you. All right, uh, here we go. Hi, um, good afternoon. So I'm here to reflect on geo blacklight. Uh, I'm going to talk about the history of our community, our growing pains, and some of our strategies for addressing them. Uh, so this is my first time at Code for Lib. Uh, it's also my first time talking about some of these issues. So I'm kind of here with my heart on my sleeve to confess some of the challenges that we've had and some of the strategies we've um, undertaken and to find out uh, if other people have uh, dealt with the same things. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, so a little preamble about myself. I'm the product manager for the Big Ten Academic Alliance GeoPortal, which is a collaboration of 14 Big Ten institutions. Um, I've been part of the Geo Blacklight community for a little over six years, uh, and I've been serving as the volunteer community coordinator for the past two. Um, so I'd like to start off by talking a little bit about what is GeoBlacklight. Uh, it's a discovery application for geospatial resources. So think uh, aerial imagery, think uh, GIS data sets, scanned maps. Um, it's built on Project Blacklight. So it shares a lot of the functionality with Blacklight, but it uh, puts spatial searching front and center. Uh, and it's collaboratively open source developed um, uh, it's a small developer community, but we do uh, work together from a few different institutions to build it together. Um, some common misconceptions, GeoBlacklight is not an interactive map builder, it's not a repository for data, and it doesn't have some kind of back-end admin interface. Um, our guiding principle is to do one thing really well, and that one thing is geospatial resource discovery. Um, here's a link to our page, geoblacklight.org slash about, that has a little bit more information about our technical values. Um, so a little history next. Uh, GeoBlacklight was born in 2014. Um, some fabulous developers at Stanford, Princeton, and MIT were the ones who created it. Um, oh, and that same year, uh, Kim Durante and Darren Hardy published an article in, um, in Code for Lib in the journal um, all about the metadata schema that they had developed for the application. It's uh, basically built on Dublin Core uh, with some spatial... Um, uh, fields added to it. Um, and so over the next year, a few more institutions uh, set up geo black lights, including the Big Ten Academic Alliance, the project I work with. Um, and in 2017, we started holding informal uh, community meetings, and this turned into biannual code sprints. Uh, but at this point, I wasn't really thinking of geo black light as a community. I was just thinking of it more as a few developers that were working on the same uh, project. Um, that really started to change, though, over time, um, especially with uh, Geo for LibCamp. So this is a unconference that Stanford University started hosting uh, in 2016. Um, and many of the ideas for innovations for Geo Blacklight got uh, cooked up at uh, Geo for Lib camps. Um, and this ended up piquing the interest of many attendees who would go back home and uh, talk to their libraries about maybe setting up a Geo Blacklight there. So as a community grows, we need to change and make room for new participation styles, new use cases, and different skill sets. Um, so the early contributors 
uh, to Geo Blacklight were uh, primarily software developers, metadata librarians, and they were coming from institutions that had spatial data in digital repositories already. They had preservation quality metadata and the technical expertise to set up geospatial web servers. Uh, later contributors were often map and geospatial librarians from smaller schools, and they might not have available developers or an institutional digital repository to pull from. We also have converts from Open GeoPortal. Uh, so Open GeoPortal is similar to GeoBlacklight, but it predates it, um, has a lot of the same um, features, uh, but it's no longer actively developed. And so a number of institutions have uh, decided to switch over to uh, GeoBlacklight. So growing pains. Uh, I've had a number of newer community members come to me and say that they were intimidated by our community, uh, that there was a lot of developer jargon thrown around and um, they were maybe not so comfortable using GitHub to communicate some of their issues or ideas. Um, the GeoBlack site's also pretty hard to install initially. Uh, it has a number of dependencies that can get uh, outdated um, or incompatible with our latest builds. Um, one of our members described this as a bad first dance. Um, Another issue is just kind of a lack of clarity to, for how to advocate for new features and how to get their ideas on the roadmap. But on the flip side, uh, a growing community can be tough for long-term members as well. Uh, one of the biggest challenges is that um, sometimes it's easier to start from scratch with a new version rather than upgrade, uh, especially if you've already got workflows established. Uh, and so for that reason, some of the longer members uh, were more resistant to change. Um, and lastly, just a lack of time. Once um, uh, something gets set up at a library, those developers are often reassigned to other projects and might not have time to come back to GeoBlacklight. So these growing pains have led to a few changes over the past years. Uh, we decided as a community to um, nominate a community coordinator, and that's been my role. I just kind of think of myself as just keeping the ball rolling, reminding everybody that we exist, set up the meetings, things like that. Um, and we uh, made some changes to our code sprints. So we stopped calling them that. We now call them community sprints in order to be more inclusive of opportunities for contributions beyond just coding. Uh, we came up with tracks. Um, and so that... Um, each track has a leader who can report out at the standups. Um, so our earliest code sprints were more of like what I think of as a duocracy where people would just show up and say, this is what I'm gonna do. And we'd say, great, go ahead. Um, but that kind of left a lot of the newer people feeling shut out. And so I feel like setting up these tracks in advance have given people um, a, a little bit of an easier time stepping into things. So, Additionally, uh, in recent years, we've had an influx of new members with metadata expertise who wanted to work on the schema. So we put together a metadata work group. Um, the bonus of this work group has been that many of the metadata experts in our community identify as women, um, and prioritizing this work has increased our gender diversity by several magnitudes. Um, this group developed a new schema for Geo Blacklight called Open Geo Metadata, and it's on its first version, uh, known as Ardvark. Uh, in case you're curious, the next version is going to be called Ardwolf. Uh, we plan to go alphabetically. Um, so upgrading the schema has been one of the more controversial things that we've done. Uh, some members felt like the schema was fine the way it was, um, but other members said that their institution wouldn't adopt GeoBlacklight unless we made these changes. Um, so upgrading the metadata requires a crosswalk, documents need to be regenerated and re-indexed. So as a community, we are moving forward with it, but it's been a bit bumpy. Um, I also want to say sometimes one person can make a difference. One of our community members became an independent contractor, um, and he uh, has helped set up Geo Blacklight at at least four different institutions that I know of. So that can be something that can help out a lot if you have an institution without a developer. 
Uh, we have a number of ongoing challenges though. Governance, uh, who gets to decide? Uh, equity, do the institutions with more money and more clout get to uh, have their features put in first? Um, fairness, um, if a community doesn't have a developer, you know, how will their commits be put in? Things like that. Um, but I don't want to end on any notes of frustration. So I'll say that um, our next plans are to have a documentation only sprint uh, to help people get uh, set up a little faster. And lastly, where I think our future lies might be in having more um, collaborative installations where multiple institutions get together and set GeoBlack up together rather than relying on just single institutions having to shoulder all the labor themselves. All right, so thank you very much. Feel free to contact me with questions or to chat. So we are now at the end, but again, we still have some more announcements. And before I get to these, I want to explicitly say we owe a round of applause and thank you to a lot of people today, the presenters, the volunteers, the various uh, local planning committee people, and especially our tech crew. And from all of us who have been working on this, particularly the LPC and steering uh, committees, thank you all for hanging in as we played the cards we were dealt with. We'll have more fun tomorrow. So tonight is the reception. The com community support squad uh, for the evening will be wearing uh, their black lanyards, uh, black and white striped lanyards. And all of the uh, support squad members are expected to be at the reception. For tonight, contact information for all the uh, all the members is available on the conduct and safety page on the conference website. So, just some logistics about the reception. The reception is at the Pearl Street Grill and Brewery on the fourth floor from 6:30 to 9 p.m. If you are riding the train, you want the Seneca Station, which is about a block west of there. Attendees must, must arrange for their own transportation to and, back and from the venue. You can find driving, walking, and metro directions on the venues page of the conference website. No badge or name tag is required for entry to the reception. If you're giving a talk for tomorrow morning, please arrive between 8 and 8.45 a.m. to load your presentation on the podium computer. Also, tomorrow, you need to have your lanyard and badge with you. Uh, do not forget it. You must have these to enter the building. Put it somewhere handy tonight so you don't forget to grab it on the way out the door in the morning. And that's it. Day one is over. Enjoy tonight, whatever you do.